So what's the topic for today, people? Since we got 11 people up in here, we might as well get started. So the topic for today is um, Pokemon battles. Now, we've talked about this before in one of our roundtable discussions. When I look back, we actually did discuss how Pokemon handles, like, Pokemon battles. But we obviously know what's been happening recently in terms of, like, uh, Twitter and um, the recent things that have happened with Twitter and how things have gone off. So, um, if you all don't know, at least my how my Twitter journey has gone, I made a tweet a while back that got over 292 likes, and I don't know if they were good or bad, but I'm starting to, but we're starting to enter the quote retweet territory, where um, I made the, the, the tweet, so y'all didn't tell me Flint got smacked like a bug today, huh? Too busy ogling at the damn opening to see the sin on Elite Four get crushed in seconds. I'm so mad at stuff like this. I made that tweet yesterday, right? And people were, um, for lack of a better word, upset by that. Reasonably upset by that. They got they got mad and uh, so how it's been canceled so far. It's pretty good. I'm, I'm liking it. I'm liking the canceled lifestyle. I like uh it's it's a you either be the hero or live long enough to be the villain but that's not like obviously i i you all know how i handle like the the retweets and the drama and stuff that happens behind all of that obviously you guys know i'm passionate about pokemon like obviously i wouldn't be making stuff videos or or content like this if i wasn't but you all know that uh, me pretty much, uh, thank you, Midnight. You, you, you all know that, uh, me, you want to know what it is, Midnight? Cause I've been thinking that too. It's because of the, I like, I'm not going to say I woke up like this, but I, when I woke up, my hair does this thing where it reacts to whatever way I slept. And this isn't to talk about like, this is just a side topic to let everybody in. Um, but when I wake up, sometimes the pillow will, like, move my hair in, like, a certain direction or, like, yeet it in a certain, like, way, like this, for example. And I was, like, instead of fixing it, I was, like, I'm going to keep it. Fuck it. Like, and then I shaved yesterday, so a lot of my facial hair looks tr more trimmed. So I was, like, fuck it. I'm just going to keep this design for right now. This is the, this will be my design for a couple of days. But anyway, back on topic. Um, so... Obviously, people are pissed about the um, about the tweet that I made uh, regarding Flint being, you know, defeated. What's up, Siri guy? We're getting a lot of people coming in, by the way. But uh, some people were reasonably, like, just liked the tweet and moved on. Some people retweeted it. Some people shared my same thoughts. And other people were all like, shut up, bitch. <laughs> but um, so obviously we've had we've had varying opinions. And when we had those varying opinions... Uh, in the moment in which I made the tweet, I was still watching the episode. Like, the two things were happening one and of the same. So, obviously, uh, what about the people who reasonably disagreed with you? Um, again, if you disagree with me, that's fine. Like, um, a lot of the dis disagreements were, uh, he's an Elite Four member who lost against a champion. He lost against Cynthia before. I'm seeing a lot of the ones where people keep saying that they lost against uh, he lost against Cynthia before. So what's the problem? Um, that was like I think I should have clarified more, and that was my fault. Obviously, the point isn't that oh Flint lost against a champion, and the point is Journeys has been very hell bent on bringing back these characters. And the fact that they went out of their way to bring back Flint only for him to get beat up in seconds. Whether you want to say, oh, Ash caught them in the middle of their battle or was late to their battle or we didn't get to see the full battle or whatever. The point being is Flint shows up and probably debatably to me one of the worst animated fights I've ever seen in my life. Not counting like older stuff. I'm talking like We'll say X, Y, forward. Um, but the problem, obviously, is when we look at the fight, it's very, very ugly. First of all, it's an ugly-looking fight. Like, let's put it that way. It's a, it's a horrendous-looking fight. Like, one of the worst animated fights since, we'll say, we'll, we'll cut it some slack and say Best Wishes. Best, the reason I say Best Wishes is because at least Best Wishes has the decency to make Pikachu's Iron Tail Iron. I like that. Like, 
to me, that's cool looking. Plus, Best Wishes, uh, if you look at uh, Ash versus Cameron's fight towards the final part of it, because I don't... The, the fight in of itself has a lot of bullshit behind it, but you can't lie. Pikachu versus Lucario is a visually good looking fight. It's a damn good looking fight. Like Pikachu does like these cool little flips and like does like the quick attack. And like once he does quick attack, he bounces off and like rockets forward and hits Lucario again and shit. And then when Lucario's flying, Pikachu uses that momentum and uses Electro Ball right afterwards. Like it's one attack coming in after another. It's a good looking fight. But that was part one of the issue, obviously. The second part of the issue is that um, Flint shows up for seconds only to get knocked away. You could have replaced Flint with pretty much any other trainer, but unfortunately, this is how Flint ends. Like, if you look at it from an anime perspective, um, Flint's entire run of Pokemon has been nothing but crippling failure from start to finish. He loses against fucking, uh, I think he, uh, I can't remember his Volkner fight that well. I need to go back and look at it. I believe he, does he win that fight or does he lose that fight? I gotta remember, that fight was so damn long ago. But I know a lot of people told me that he lost against Cynthia too, which doesn't help his case. If anything, that makes it worse. It means if Flint's supposed to be an Elite Four member, and yes, I know he's losing to a champion. A champion obviously holds the the, the clout of being the stronger trainer. That That much we know. The problem here, though, starts, he won against Ash. Okay, that's, that's fine. Ash is, at this point, still a regular Ash trainer, to the most part. He can hold his own against a couple others. The most he's done at this point is be, like, Frontier Brains. And I'm not power scaling these trainers, by the way. Obviously, trainers can beat other trainers just based off circumstance, buildup of team, different situations, choice of attack moves, choice of Pokemon. It's not as linear as this as Ash Ketchum has a, bow, uh, a Pokemon trainer power level of 300, and, uh, I don't know, we'll say Hop, has a battle Pokemon trainer level of fucking 100 or something, so obviously he one beats the other. It's it's like that. He never battles Volkner, I don't think. Um, so, yeah, like, it's, it's not as simple as, oh, these trainers can beat these others based off of, like, just this one variable. The, the issue that I had with that fight was mostly because, one, visually it's terrible, and two, Flint gets flicked off like a bug in seconds in the fight to really just show off how strong Leon is, but we already have a fight that does that. It's Leon versus Lance, which I argue, to me, was one of the better fights. Not just because Lance and Leon are both champions, because Lance actually does a really good job in his move choices, uh, the Pokemon that he uses... The, the strategy that he uses, the fact that he uses a max airstream to increase his speed so that he can use max guard right after to block himself from Charizard's next attack, that is a good strategy. If you were to ask me exactly how the fight went with Flint and Leon, even though this episode just happened, I couldn't even give you an accurate answer because the fight looks so god, god uh, gaudy, gaudy, I meant to say gaudy. The fight looks so gaudy that it's really hard to determine what happens here. Infernape sort of floats to the side, and then Charizard, he's about to use his uh, attack against Charizard, and Charizard just uses Flamethrower, and I'm just like, okay, and then he just moves out the way, and then he finally gets hit by Charizard's Dragon Claw and loses. It almost, you even see Infernape in midair just float to the side. I'm like, so can Infernape fly now? What What's happening? <laughs> it's such a silly looking fight, and it's not a good impression on Flint. Like, even, if you can even, I will, I'll say this, you can even lose a battle, but it still looks like well enough to show that you're holding your own well enough to at least make the fight look visually pleasing. And unfortunately, this battle doesn't look like it gives us both. With or without context, this battle looks terrible. So, unfortunately, we run into one of those situations where the battle, unfortunately, doesn't tell a good story, which really, which transitions us straight into this topic. Does a battle even tell a story? And I wanted to ask to chat this for a while and let you guys answer that while I go, you know, check the comments and do my background stream shit and grab some water. Um, I'm going to ask the chat legitimately, and then we'll tackle it, and we'll talk about this subject. Does it? Do you believe that a Pokemon battle can tell a story? Can, 
Can a Pokemon battle do an effective job telling a story? And then I'll come back and I'll give my take. That's exactly how, obviously, we want this to show. So John says, yes, absolutely. So while you guys go answer that question, I'm going to go grab uh, some water because we're going to be talking a lot, obviously. And I want to, I want to, um... I want to I want to tackle this and we would and I want to relate this to the episodes of journeys that we've gotten so far. Also, what's up, Janice uh, and Aqua Sakura? What's up? So uh, I will be right back. You guys feel free to answer, answer the question, discuss amongst yourselves, and then I'll come back and then we're going to actually tackle this topic. All right, let's see what we got. I'm going to have to scroll up because I see a lot of comments, actually. Oh, I don't need those. Not right now, at least. Um, Let's see, what do we got? Uh, da, 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 Dragonite's cool, but bringing back the Red Gyarados. Why does it matter? Okay, Obstagoon says yes. Yes, it played out right. Yes, a battle can tell a story. It doesn't have to, uh, oft, always have to, though. Mm, okay. Uh, oh, so I arrived just in the main topic despite being late. Good. Uh, but this battle wasn't supposed to tell a story. Okay. Sure, this battle was basically supposed to to pad out time. Okay. And sometimes that's okay. Ash and Paul's a great example. Good. Simply yes. Other battles, though, I'm not so sure. Some are just fun. Yes, Ash. And Paul's whole story was uh, through, like, if the episode was squarely about Leon and Flint's battle, like how episode 12 was squarely focused on uh, Leon and Lance's battle, I will say a battle can tell a story. Battles not only tell a story, but it also adds to the world, okay? Uh, case in point, Ash's battle versus Brock uh, is what made Brock uh, to be a character and uh, versus May made her equal to him, okay? Then it would be a problem if the battle were not to tell a story a bit of... Uh, uh, depends on the circumstances, but yeah, basically. All right, so, perfectly. The reason that I asked that is because in this particular situation, and I want to go into this knowing that I'm not ignorant to the circumstances that were given in the episode. I know that Flint versus Leon isn't the main focus of the episode. The main focus of the episode is Ash hanging out with Leon to get to know him a little bit better before being in the top eight to where he fights him later. Honestly, I think an episode like that should have happened much sooner in Journeys, but that's a topic for a whole nother day. Um, but to show that off, we use a familiar face, Flint. Now, the point that I brought up when I said that was the fact that Flint is a character that we know. We, as well as Ash, know who this character is. And Flint, for the most part, what do you know about his character? What do you know from watching Diamond and Pearl? You know about his character. You know about how he is. You know that he, that he, you know, is a participant. And you even see that he's obviously ranked seven by the time he does this fight. So he's way up there. So in off-screen land, he kicked ass to get up there. That's perfectly fine. But... When doing a fight, what's up, Deathstar? I find it funny how PM has completely forgotten the G-Max Pikachu plot point. Deathstar, I, I, I got no words for that. I think what they've decided to do instead was, I think what they've, uh, what Journeys is going for is each Pokemon on Ash's team, for the most part, 
is going to have like its own gimmick related to each of the uh, regions or at least the regions that have given us one. For example, Pikachu's main focus is going to be Pikachu and Z because that's the bond between Ash and Pikachu and Alola. It did a lot to increase their bond. So then you got Lucario learning the Mega Evolution where they decided to finally give Ash or Lucario because now's the time to give him one instead of in Diamond and Pearl when he should have gotten one. Um, and then uh, Gengar can Gigantamax. So because it has a Gigantamax, the show said, fuck it. And we'll use show off that one more instead of Pikachu's. Because fuck it, why not? Uh, G-Max 2 isn't a plot point. It's just a showcase that shows... Like how Eevee will be. Gengar is G-Max Ur are on the team now. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Like he he's taking Pikachu's role as the G-Maxer. I mean, and to be fair, it's because Pikachu has an exclusive move with Ash. So I guess they thought that had priority. But going back into the topic though, um, usually when a battle, or at least an observable battle that you see, uh, where the trainers are fighting. They made it a point to bring back Flint specifically. Why Flint specifically, though? Like, there's a bunch of other trainers they could have made for this particular episode. Because really, the trainers were meant to fight Leon and then lose. Ultimately, if you see a fight with Leon that isn't Ashes, more than likely it's meant for that character to lose. That character has to lose in order to show that Leon's number one, which Leon has already been shown to be an unbeatable trainer. So, since he's an unbeatable trainer, every trainer that goes up against Leon's pretty much like on this level of, okay, it's not exactly when they lose, it's how they lose. And Flint's fight, for the most part, isn't even visually pleasing to look at, let alone you look at it and go, oh, okay, yeah, that, 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 was, that was a pretty cool fight. Like I said earlier, Lance was in the uh was in the same predicament and honestly I think Lance's fight beats Flint's by a long shot and yes I know that fight was more to focus on Lance versus Leon but at the same time it was to introduce Ash to Leon and this one is Ash being reintroduced to Leon but in a comp but in a different context here Ash happened to wake up and just run into an idea where oh Leon's in a fight let me go ahead and check that out but here, they hand wave it as, okay, Leon's taking out some nobody. When in fact, it's Flynn of the Elite Four. And I think the, the thing that we've always looked at here is that the community has pretty much leaned on the idea that Journeys needs to bring back characters. Like, oh, bring back this, bring back this. Like, whenever you look on Twitter... The main thing you see is, oh, I hope Journeys brings back this character. Or, ooh, I want to see this character again. Or, ooh, this character needs to redeem themselves from last time when whatever happened. Like, they've been mostly leaning towards that whole bring back this character thing. So, if you look at Leon, uh, you, not Leon, sorry. If you look at Flint, unfortunately, it's, oh, bring back the dog. Well, he got smacked. Well, whew. Bring back Karina. Oh, she got smacked twice. Once by Ash and once by B. Ooh, bring back this character. Oh, Don got smacked twice by Rhyferia, and uh, Koharu was able to smack it with an Eevee that's relatively young, despite the fact that Don has had Piplup for years. It just, it's a very, it, it, it gets very uncomfortable to look at when you're looking at it through the perspective of someone who knows these characters personally. Karina got a good battle and further involvement in the story. Uh, nah. That fight she had with, um... I think the problem, and, and, and this this one I will admit is unfair. Well, I wouldn't say unfair. I wouldn't say unfair. Because they're, they're bringing her back, so they obviously are using her assets. They're using what made her great in the first place. You gotta, like, when you look at this fight versus the original fight uh, Ash and her had and X and Y, and then add on the context of the battles that they had before the actual gym fight in, Shal in Shalar, and it's like night and day. I went back just to think that I wasn't crazy either. I went back to look at the fight and go, wait a minute. Nah, maybe I'm just uh, making, maybe the Karina fight in my head and the gym leader fight in my head was just better because I'm thinking that it's better because I liked it back then. So I went back to watch it uh, early this year in January. Nah, that fight's still fucking amazing. And then I go back and look at the Journeys fight and go, 
Okay, maybe it's been a while. Maybe let's rewatch it. Nah, they're still not on the same par. It's it's basically night and day. It's not a good fight at all. Like it 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 is it is debatably very sad how bad that is compared to at least compared to the gym leader fight. I've always argued to this day. I've I've always argued to this day the best journeys battle we've had. Like, like, not not even just visually, storytelling wise. To me, the best journeys fight we've had up to this point was back in episode eighteen, the Ash versus Viscous fight. Like, to me, that's like the best fight journeys has given us. That fight's really good. That fight's good. We see while Gengar loses that fight. No, he, uh, yeah, Gengar loses to Elect uh, Electrode. I think he beats Raichu, and it shows that Gengar has this cool little unique, spooky, like chaotic battle style. That Raichu can't keep up with, but Raichu can keep up with Pikachu. Ash even knows that in the fight, that Viscous' is Raichu isn't some regular Raichu. It's very clear that um, Viscous trained her Raichu to take on all threats that are similar to itself. So in a speed slash power battle, Raichu was beating Pikachu and Ash realized that. That's why Ash says, yo, Pikachu, come back. Let's use an unpredictable Pokemon, Gengar. So Gengar gets good representation. And then Pikachu fights Electro, but Ash gets creative and finds out, oh, I can use Iron Tail and hold Electro down so that it can slow down its like speed of rotation and stop it from bouncing all over the damn place. And it's cool to see an Electro be used creatively. Pokemon has never really used Electro creatively. Normally what they have Electro do is blow up and that's it that's literally all he does in most of his debuts here we get to see electro use magnet rise and bounce off the freaking rocks and like ricochet everywhere and hit things all over and hit them with electricity and like roll out them it, it it's cool it's cool to actually see that take place that's a cool fight it's a visually awesome looking fight that is a good one visually it's good Two, it showed that both Viscous and Ash are being very creative with the battle styles that they've been given in the Pokemon that they're working with. And three, it shows Pokemon being used in more creative ways. And four, it does do a callback. It does a callback to Ash's fight with Lieutenant Surge. But it doesn't hopelessly bring Lieutenant Surge back to go, look, Lieutenant Surge exists. Get your nostalgia all up. Don't you remember him? Wasn't he fun? No, they gave Lieutenant Surge a successor, which means we learn more about Lieutenant Surge without him even physically being there. He taught another, he taught other students. He made the trainers get stronger. And as a result, the Vermilion City Gym has better challengers because of it. The tournament is being uh, displayed. The world championships, Ash gets requested to a fight during that point. Or I think Ash actually requested Visky's fight. I think that was the, I don't know if it was in reverse. The point is, Episode 18 is one of the best battle episodes this show's got and hasn't gotten better since then, unfortunately, like battle-wise. This is the best fight they debatably have. Yeah, Ash requests her, which we don't really see much of that either. Ash doesn't request it, uh, for any fights. So it was cool to see that Ash looked for somebody that just happened to relate to somebody that he knew once before. The show doesn't pound us with nostalgia. It gives us a subtle slip of it. Like here, yeah, this is a familiar face, but not in the way you remember it. It's sort of like a, oh, you, uh, hi, I know you. You know me. How do you know me? You fought my master once. Who's your master? Lieutenant Surge. Oh, I fought Lieutenant Surge one time. I know what you're talking about. And she's like, yes. We saw that you had Pikachu stick its tail into the ground in order to absorb electricity like a lightning rod. I want to challenge that. And then we get a nice, gradual battle with with tactics and skills and character interest. This was at the beginning of Journeys that actually made me optimistic for the rest of the World Championships. But then the rest of the show happened and, and things looked a little... <laughs> Yeah, I, I know, I know. Stop, stop. Uh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, or the rest of the fights became... Well, you know. <laughs> in addition to being, uh, off... In addition to being off-screen for most of those fights, 
Uh, we follow that formula that Terrell had beautifully stated was the training, uh, well, no, the trial, uh, training, and triumph. Or trouble, tri uh, trouble, training, and triumph. That's what he deemed them. Where the formula goes as follows. Uh, Ash and or Pokemon on Ash's team loses, has to train one episode, and then they beat the challenge the, the episode after. This formula was used against uh, against B, where Ash lost against B, trained, fought against B, drew against B, fought B a third time, beat B. Uh, this fight was used with Riolu. Riolu lost against um, against uh, Graplock, uh, then trained, then fought against it again, tied against it, fought again, then beat it uh, as a Lucario. Then this fight happened again with uh, Rento. Thank you, Koro. Uh, Farfetch loses against Rento, trains to get stronger, fights off against Rento again, evolves and beats it, and doesn't get another win until much... I, I, oh, shit, it hasn't gotten a win since then. Farfetch hasn't gotten a win or a major debut in the show since then, except the episode where he cuts the letter open during the Iris episode. Then you've got Iris coming back, only to have her Pokemon that she trained for years get smacked by Pokemon that Ash caught within a couple of weeks, Dracovish and Dragonite. And obviously, no, I don't mean a couple of weeks as in literal. I mean a couple of weeks as an exaggeration for the fact that Ash has had Dragonite and Dracovish for a lot less time than Iris has had Axew and, uh, and Dragonite. Pokemon that Iris has literally trained for since Best Wishes onwards immediately getting smacked by Pokemon that um, that Ash caught like a couple of seconds. Uh, what's, let's read the comments. Kind of wish Ash watched an old companion battle in the PB. Yeah, that, yeah, actually I do too. Uh, it always has to be either someone versus Ash or someone versus Leon. Exactly. It always gets boring after a while. Uh, that's just me though. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, and I made, actually, no, to a... Uh, Two steps, uh, two step, Tony. I'm glad you pointed that out. I'll save it for later. Death Star says Ash's PM team is undercooked and it feels like uh, they're the ones taking him this far. Uh, they're barely even a unit and seldomly appear. Uh, just look at the Duck and Dracovish. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Still uh, hate the way the team's being ha handled. It, I, like, I'm not the only one saying these things, guys. Like, it's not just me saying these things. When I say these things, I'm saying them usually because I'm analyzing the show, watching the episodes carefully so that I can know what the hell that I'm talking about when I say these things. And then I do a, and then I do a review on the Pokepot like everybody else. And I watch these episodes very carefully to make sure that I'm doing my research, to make sure that I give all points a fair shot. And if you guys have watched the Pokepot, faithful uh, viewers of the Pokepot, you know there's actually episodes I do like. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have sat and uh, thought that I generally hate every episode this show has had to offer. There's a lot of episodes that are that strand between uh, below average, mediocre, and bad. Yes, obviously. But other than that, there have been episodes that I enjoyed. And I just named one. Episode 18, I like episode 12 too, which I named earlier in this too. So it's not. So I make sure to give everything its fair shot before I start going off. I always make sure it's at least fair, and I made my analysis. Episodes 12 and 18 were episodes I really liked because they do a good job of setting up the world championships. But that's before we even knew what the world championships um, were even were. I mean, a true Kaito, but that's more of the reason why more I make the content. I make the content and I do the streams with KG and the others, which you should totally watch. The Pokepod is at 9 p.m. Central on Mondays. Um, so that you can see my few, full, few view, viewing of these and how I make my analysis. These aren't just me being angry at a show for the sake of being angry or to absorb cloud or whatever reason that Twitter believes that I do do these analysis for. When I watch these, I'm making a careful analysis and study based on what I see. It is a cr uh, constructive criticism critique. It's not me yelling at the mic going... <laughs> This, this show's fucking stupid because it's stupid and I miss the days where Ash was good and, and the animation was good and the drawing was good and everything's just stupid because I said it's stupid. Make sure you like and subscribe. 
I'm making these because I'm sitting here watching and analyzing and giving everything its fair shot so that when I say my analysis, it's coming from some level of truth and good faith. I'm watching the show and I just don't like what I'm given. And then people usually make the argument, well, then why do you watch them? One, because if I make the analysis and we're in a discussion podcast, which I'm a part of every Monday, and I say I don't like something and someone makes the argument, well, you didn't watch it. That would hold, that would make sense. Judging, making constructive criticism on something you haven't watched, making constructive criticism on something you've watched, analyzed, and break down are two completely different levels of criticism. If you watch something, you analyze it, break it down, go through it, and make a method, which I do, I write this shit down, um, then at least it shows, oh, he at least pays attention to it enough to give it the respect in order to, you know, discuss what he's talking about. When I make my analysis, I can be uh, driven by passion. You guys do too. A lot of people on Twitter will take this to an absolute unhumanly like extreme um, to where they really devote themselves to this on a level that's almost inhuman. <laughs> but um, when I make it, obviously, if I'm upset, I'm going to be upset about it because, again, I like to at least make sure there's a level of character to me because I don't want to sit up here and say, I don't enjoy that. I think it wasn't good. I am upset by the content that was given to me. I feel it could have been better. Like, no, that's boring. Nobody wants to fucking say that. Right? Obviously, when I do it, I try to make sure that I have some level of character to it. I make sure that there's something that invests, that's involved. Because if my audience is going to see me and see me deliver content, then they at least deserve for me to give a damn. If I give a damn, they give a damn. Period. Right? That makes sense. So when we talk about these battles... Uh, I talk about these battles usually based off of the premise of what I've seen, not just from even Pokemon battles, from anime battles in general that tell a story. If you see that a character is like, for example, we'll give an example of a battle. If you see a battle where a character is losing the battle at the start, but then they like look around and they notice like, uh, ooh, there's a, a rock, a large rock. And during the fight, they escape the fight, run away and hide behind the rock. And the opponent hits the rock. And when the rock blows up or whatever, or dissipates or whatever then the uh while they were doing that the while they were so focused on destroying the rock so that they can get to their opponent uh the character pulled like some cool little trap behind the rock and it uh, backfires and the opponent gets hit and then they take advantage of the fight and now they're winning the fight the person who was losing that tells a story it shows one the create the character who was losing the fight is observant it shows that they're creative, and it shows that they can turn the fight around based on the resources that they've been given. That's a story. How does Pokemon util utilize this? Well, Pokemon has run into these situations a lot of times in the past where, uh, I think you all know, Ash will like, be in a battle. He'll look around in the battle, and then like he'll stop and stare at something and go, Oh! And you, you see it, like the, like the, the little shock face. And then he'll go, uh, Pikachu, use that. Or he'll say, Pikachu, jump off this thing. Or Pikachu, uh, dodge and then get behind this or something. He'll, t he'll tell his Pokemon to do something related to what he sees around him. Even in the Thunder Armor thing, which was silly in and of itself, Ash looks at the sky and goes, wait a minute, the storm clouds. He does that because he has Pikachu use Thunderbolt in the air so that the Thunderbolt can come back down, slam on Pikachu, and create that coat of armor that we see later, which is the thunder armor that he uses to win the fight against Tate and Liza. But it's this level of, uh, of, of observant, like, strategy that he uses that helps guide the fight along and makes you understand, that, at least in the audience's perspective, ah, that's how he did that. How do we relate this to, like, say, Ash versus Volkner? A fight that's very heavy mixed, because I've... Now, this com this uh, conflict happened, and I wasn't even a part of this one, but I thought it was funny. Um, but I did do a uh, roundtable discussion about this one. The fight in question is when Pikachu uses... Uh, Pikachu winds up using uh, Pikachunium Z against Electivire. Now, in this fight, the issue is, is that Pikachu is using this... Uh, using this attack. And when he uses this attack... 
Um, the issue is that Electivire has Motor Drive. And for those of y'all who don't know, Motor Drive is an ability that allows Electivire to pretty much be immune to electricity. He can absorb electricity and make his special attack higher as a, as a result in the video games. Let's say you never watched, uh, played the video games and you only watch Pokemon in the anime. Um, then this would be confusing. This would be absolutely confusing. In their eyes, it would be Electivire just absorbed an electricity move and now Pikachu can't use electric moves in the fight. How is he going to get out of this? And Ash's strategy? There is no strategy. He just uses the biggest electric move that he's got. And Electivire absorbs it until he can't absorb it anymore. And then ends up blowing up. Now, in any situation, this would be absolutely fine. I've even sat and said I have no problem with this move working. I think the problem is that the show didn't even realize it was going to do this until last minute. Volkner has to explain it after the fact that Pikachu's Electrunia, uh, Pikachu's, uh, Electrunia's, uh, Trunium Z move was so powerful that, uh, Electivire just couldn't take it, which would be enough of an explanation to sort of hand wave it off as a, that's what happened, but we don't even get Ash strategizing around it, Ash just goes, all right, screw it, we're gonna go ahead and use the biggest move we got, <laughs> like, like, and that's on top of Lucario getting the shit kicked out of it in the fight. Like, Lucario in no way, shape, or form should have won that, uh, his fight in that battle against Volkner. But he does, because Lucario can't really, like, lose this fight or else it won't look good for his whole win-lose streak. So Lucario has to win it. And Gengar, poor Gengar, poor, poor Gengar, he... Gengar gets gets the stuff and kicked out of it in this fight, and I'm not even sure how or why. So the fight just unfortunately, and this debate went back and forth. Um, a lot of people on Twitter went way back and forth about this. Some people were like, "Oh, it's the anime logic, not the game logic." Some people were like, "Oh, it's the game logic, not the anime logic." Like people were people were about to slit each other's throats just for this fight alone. And my take on it was this. The fact that we had to do that back and forth over that was because the fight doesn't do a good job of, like, setting up for it. I was even on the team of, yeah, I know in the video games, electric-type moves don't work on motor drive. I know that. But I'm fully prepared for a reality where this move, in particular, can overpower Electrovire and beat it. That's not out of the range of possibility to me. I can accept it. I think the problem is the context of it. The context goes, well, if he can or can't, we as the audience have no clue on it. If you never even played the video games, then this looks confusing as hell. It looks like Pikachu just sort of overpowered Electivire because the anime said so. And if you play the video games that are faithful to them, and this is your first anime, uh, anime watch, like let's say this is somebody's first series, which, oh god. Uh, if Pokemon Journeys is your first anime series... Uh, and you haven't watched any Pokemon series outside of that, then this looks horribly confusing for video game players. Then you'd be like, wait a minute, how did Pikachu beat the move here? Then someone's going to yell at you saying that it's video game logic. Okay, great. But you want to know who else followed video game logic in, the, uh, in this entire thing? Volkner. He follows it to a T. In fact, the man does a really good job of it. He does electric terrain in order to make Luxray stronger and his attack stronger. He uses Rotom's Hex after he paralyzes uh, one of the Pokemon in order to make Hex stronger. He does this cool thing where he has, ele um, he has uh, electric terrain to like, decrease the amount of damage that one move does and makes it so another Pokemon can't go to... like. Volkner does a really good job in this fight. He even uses Rising Voltage in combination with Electric Terrain. If you were to ask me right now who deserves to win this fight off video game strategies alone, Volkner takes the cake. I would know. I would have clapped my hardest, not because I want Ash to lose, but Volkner did a really good job in the fight. If we look at Volkner's half of the battle, he does a good job in the fight. He like It's a good fight. So if we look at it through that perspective, it's a good fight for Volkner. <laughs> but unfortunately, the anime has a quota to fulfill, and Ash has to win to make his imaginary battle number go up. So unfortunately, Ash has to kick the shit out of him, regardless of the fact that he has a good strategy. And that's what bums people out about the fight. 
if this were just some regular uh, regular one-off character who used the, who happened to use the electric type Pokemon and Pikachu beat him because this was to showcase the Z move that Ash uses that he got from Alola, then that's fine. But it's not. It's Volkner, a character we've already familiarized ourselves with, and a character who comes back and actually does a legitimately good job in the gym fight. The gym fight in question, he's doing such a good job because he has such a good strategy. Here, unfortunately, all that good strategy doesn't matter because Pikachu can just sort of, like, rough man his way through the fight and it doesn't look good. That's what the issue is. The issue has never been about whether the electric Z-move can beat the ability or the ability can beat the Z-move. It's no question. In this particular context, the Z-move has to win. But it's the way that it wins is what's messy. And that's why I asked earlier, can battles tell a story? Because the story here isn't unfortunately, is, unfortunately isn't good. It's not a good story. It doesn't really tell the story of how Ash and Pikachu are developing a strategic strategy to beat Electivire. It's telling the story of how Ash and Pikachu just sort of luck out and beat Electivire off pure power. Which isn't good. It's not a good, it's not a good look. It makes the fight look sloppy. Because now you have this situation where a legitimately good strategy out, gets outclassed for something as simple as the big electric attack ate it. And again, if maybe if we had seen a situation where, like, I don't know, we, we, because we, sometimes the show does a good job uh, of doing this too. Not, not this show, but shows in general have done a good job of doing this too. I'll give an example um, uh, in X and Y. When X, in X and Y, Ash is training because he lost the viola the first time. So Clement invents this machine. And the machine is supposed to shoot like this wide because it's supposed to shoot these wides because it's supposed to imitate the move Sticky Webs, which is a move that uh, Viola uses earlier in the fight with uh, Surskit. Surskit. Um. So when he when she does that, Clement invents a move that imitates the Sticky Webs. Unfortunately, the machine goes haywire, and what happens is that it shoots a bunch of Sticky Webs in the air. And they all fall back down, land on the machine, and blow it up. It's later in the gym fight that Ash thinks, oh shoot, Pikachu's gonna be asleep soon because of the sleep powder. What do I do? And then he thinks, oh, that's right. Clement's machine malfunctioned just, uh, just like what happened last time. He has Pikachu use the electro ball in the air. The electro ball flies up, lands back down, and hits Pikachu in the head before he gets the chance to go to sleep, waking Pikachu back up and getting into the fight. It's that observation that he made earlier that helps him in the fight now. How does this relate to the potential Volkner situation? Well, we have an episode that leads into it where Ash is in Alola, then gets the call from Volkner as a request for the fight. In that episode, we could have seen that, oh, maybe during a battle in one of those episodes, an attack becomes overpowered and it's too much for something to handle and Ash goes, huh. So if you pump something up too much, then it causes an explosion. Then we cut to the fight with Ash and Volkner. The fight happens. How do I beat Motor Drive? Wait a minute. I remember. There is a similar situation me and Go ran into earlier. We use that. Let's use that. And then we can apply it. That's how you create a battle story. That's how you create the fact that he's using his resources in order to help him in a fight earlier. Uh, give me a second, I'm reading the comments. But the battle that sparked this discussion was this week. Again, I'm saying the topic is do battles tell a story? I'm talking about all battles, not in general, not just this one. Um, so, let's see, he's not talking about this week's. He's talking about battles in general, yes. Um, so... How does that relate to here? We see here that when that is used, when a formula is used, it's a lot easier for the audience to digest. Whereas here, we're supposed, like, in that particular fight with Volkner, I think they would, the writers just wanted us to assume that that's just naturally what could have happened in that situation. 
that Pikachu's Electrunium Z, Pikachu Pikachunium Z move was supposed to naturally just be so much that Electrovire can't handle it. Which, the fight is placed unfairishly on Volkner's half too, because if Ash at least gets the chance to use a Z move, what does Volkner get to use? He doesn't get a Z move, he doesn't get a Dynamax, he doesn't get anything. He just unfairishly is given this chance, like, has to fight Ash with no prep, no Mega Evolutions, no Z moves, no nothing. Yeah, totally a fair fight. <laughs> Actually, this tactic being uh, been going on for a while. Recently, I watched Ash versus Whitney's battle, and the second battle, uh, Team Rocket comes in with the barrel and uses uh, Cyndaquil's tackle and Totodile's water gun to make the trenches in the ground to mess up Team Rocket's barrel. Because of that, Ash uses it against Whitney's milk tank in her rollout. Yes, that is a good example. That is a good example. Volkner never trained to get a Z move, Ash did. That's not the point, Kaito. I'm saying, like, he doesn't even get to use a gimmick. He doesn't get to use Dynamax, a Z move, or Mega Evolution, for that matter. And then, according to this context, the announcer even downright says it. A trainer is allowed to use any gimmick. So why doesn't Volkner use any? Like, it's... It's placed in a way to where we just have to sort of accept that Ash has this thing that allows him to overpower Volkner, and Volkner doesn't even get a chance to, like, properly prep for it. He decides not to. And again, that's his choice to make. That's fine. The problem isn't the fact that he does or doesn't get a choice. The problem here is the fact that the show doesn't even give him the option. Like, he, like, he has... The problem here, I think, is the fact that on our side, we're looking at we're looking at a trainer who does use a gimmick and uses it to its fullest advantage against a Pokemon who essentially would have beat him otherwise. It almost feels like, let's strip away, let's put them both on equal terms and say that we took uh, Ash's gimmicks away. It means that, unfortunately, if we were to do this uh, no gimmick to no gimmick, Ash, unfortunately, gets the raw side of the deal here and loses. But the fight can't have him lose, so he has this overpowered move that even if overpowered technically couldn't beat Electivire in this particular case, but in the anime it has to because anime logic. The argument that I commonly saw during this fight was the fact that, oh, Ash is following anime logic and thus he's able to beat out um, the video game logic. The video game logic, because I don't know if you guys have played Sun and Moon or Ultra Sun and Moon, if you use this move, in the video games, it just won't work. No matter how much fate you had in Pikachu, if you use uh, one, one million Thunderbolts against uh, Electivire and it has Moto Drive, Moto Drive will just absorb the move. Nothing will happen. The only thing that will happen is that Electivire special attack will go up. And then he'll just win the fight. That's the sad, cold reality of it. And that's the argument that most people were bringing up in the, in the, in the, on Twitter. When people went back and forth on Twitter about this topic, the topic was the fact that, oh, unfortunately, this wouldn't happen in the video games. And people would go, well, this is the anime, not the video games. The problem is, if they if that's the case, then how come Volkner didn't pull some anime nonsense? How come, like, we've seen it before. And I'm, I made the argument back then, too. I said, how come uh, Volkner didn't have Electivire yeet its tails into the ground to absorb the electricity? In this anime, they do that. In Ash's fight against Viskies, he does that. In Paul's fight, he has his Electivire do it. So it can be used again. We've seen it. But he doesn't do it because the show just doesn't need him to do it right now. It feels kind of strange. Like, if unfortunately, this show really likes to use the past as its way to, like, sell itself. It's like, oh, we, we're going to use familiar faces because people are familiar with those faces and that'll bring our audience in. Great. But you're not going to use familiar tactics. You didn't have Volkner have his Electivire use that tactic, which would have immediately made the fight completely on Volkner's favor. But they didn't do it because Volkner would have won. <laughs> And no matter how many ways you look at it, I think the the main issue that people had on uh, with that fight on Twitter was that Volkner should have won. Like, uh, no matter which way you 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 stare at it, Volkner should have won that fight. But if we move out of Volkner and Ash's fight and just move on to other fights, not many of them are really handled with the same level of care. 
We've even seen people argue that the uh, recent fight with uh, Marnie was a terrible fight, which I will agree with as well. That fight was not handled very well, too, because unfortunately that fight had to share a lot of things. It had to share uh, Gengar's, like, battle time along with Marnie, along with Piers, along with the entire introduction of that. And we don't even get Team Yell telling Ash, like, directly, like... When they tell him where the, the gym fight's taking place, it's sort of hand-hafted as like a, hey, you guys told me that. Okay, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, it, it's so unfocused because it has to share a 24-minute timeline with a bunch of other stuff that happens where it's very clear Marnie's fight should have at least been a two-parter or a three-parter fight, an arc. But it's not handled with that level of care. It's handled as like a... We gotta shove all this stuff into one, so this fight is reduced to nothing more than a couple of moves being used here and there, and Ash just going, oh, that's right, Gengar, eat, eat, um, go ahead and eat Grimmsnarl. Yeah, that's how we'll win the fight, and that's how it's handled. That's how the fight's handled, unfortunately, and it's not a good way to handle the fight, but let's read the comments for a second. Uh, they want the privilege of continuity, but not the consequences, exactly. Uh, Ash is the only one using it. Uh, they use continuity uh, very well. Volkner didn't lose uh, because it would have made Iris uh, second Karina. Yes, it was. I mean, I don't mind them using past characters. Problem is, the series sucks ass with majority of their writing. Orion Sword uh, sort of nailed it. Uh, that kind of sucks based on past characters writing. Ash is the type to make his battles as fair as possible. While I do agree it could have benefited more from parts, uh, got a rush because uh, G9, yeah. PWC was likely ending in a few months, so I, uh, I was worried for the Masters. Ash being reactive isn't a bad thing. Um, also, the fight was very predictable to me. Uh, yeah, Nessa brought this up actually earlier one time in a discussion we talked about, and I'll, I'll tackle that in a minute. I see the moment whoever uses Jiding Antimax first, you lost. Yep. Karina and XY had seven episodes. The Darkest Day and Journeys had four. Let that sink in. Again, the battle results feel off at times. Yes, uh, Lucario tanking an unreasonable amount of attacks like he did later. And the B fight, I'll tackle that later too. I'm glad you brought that up. How is the fight predictable? Um, Nessa already explained it. Whoever Gigantamaxes first wins, which we could see that. We could see that pretty much from get-go. They use Gigantamax uh, so well, for example, like when you have ever seen a Pokemon G-Max at different times. Yeah, but unfortunately, that kind of told its story. Marnie Gigantamaxed way too soon, and even the show tackled it where Lucario didn't want to Mega Evolve as soon as, like, B Gigantamax. Why? Because when B Gigantamax, we knew what was going to happen. Her Gigantamax was going to, like, end because it has a certain amount of time. And then once it devolved, we knew at this point her fate was sealed. She lost, which was the same thing that happened with Marnie. Marnie Gigantamax Grimmsnarl at the beginning of the fight. And at that point, you look at the time and go, huh, well, it's very clear that she got Gigantamax this early in the fight. Which means it's only going to get its shit kicked in afterwards. Ash still hasn't done it yet. He hasn't released his trump card. Which means, what is Grimstar going to do against the Gigantamax Gengar? It's going to lose. It actually would have been kind of interesting if even after Ash Gigantamax, he still lost. Because then that would have changed it up. Oh, snaps. Even after learning how to do it, Marty could have been like, yeah, you learned how to Gigantamax. That's great and all, but that's not going to be enough to win the fight. And then Ash would have went, huh. Well, guess we and Gengar have a lot more to learn. But no, they don't do that. It's very clear after he Gigantamaxes, he goes, okay, cool. Let's wrap up the rest of the fight. And wrap up the rest of the fight they did. Really wish Gengar would have been the MVP for Volkner's battle instead of Lucario popping off. That actually would have been really unexpected and cool, actually. Uh, it did most of the heavy lifting on Luxray. Uh, well, we still know nothing about Marnie after the battle. Exact. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. But you get at this point, it's very clear that I'm not the only one seeing in this, and that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Grim Snow held its own against G Max Gengar. It even tore through G Max Terror. It did, but uh, unfortunately, the fight already kind of like we we knew where the fight was going with the time that we were given. Unfortunately, I think uh, if Ash was going to use any gimmicks in this tournament, he battle uh, a lot more interesting. Uh, Regina got a character in a flashback. Marnie gets nothing. Which Ash uses fucking Fossil Bond for once. Yeah. Dracovish hasn't even seen any fights. 
Like, yeah, Dracovish hasn't even seen any battles for real since then. Um, Obstagoon, I do want to say, um, if it, if you disagree with the, uh, with the stuff, fine, we'll definitely debate it, but please refrain from, like, you know, talking about the others in a negative term. It's one thing to say, hey, I respectfully disagree, and here's my points, and I tackled them, I read them, uh, but don't, but don't say you guys don't know anything, or, like, that's unfair to them. That's disingenuous to them. They're all having a, they're all having an opinion, and their opinions just happen to line up with each other's. But if you have something that goes against it, I mean, I read I read the comments. I'll I'll read them, and I like I'll respectfully disagree or agree if I feel the same way. Like I said, this is a podcast where everyone gives constructive criticism, and you can see that when they say something. They add on to something more as they say it. They don't just say, oh, this fight sucked and then end it at that. They say, oh, I don't like this fight because this fight had this in it. Or, oh, I feel this was bad because this was handled uh, better in this particular situation. But I do want to say that if you disagree with something, disagree with it in the way of saying, hey, we had this. Because you brought up points too. Uh, in the fight, you state that... Um, Marnie is a less experienced trainer than Ash, after all. That's a fair point. That is a fair point. However, this is also Marnie's debut episode, and this is at the point where Marnie is trying to prove that she can win a fight without the help of Team Yell. Unfortunately, her first fight where she gets the chance to prove herself, she can't prove herself because she loses in literally less than sec, like minutes. She loses in minutes. She doesn't even get the chance to prove much. It's a 1v1 fight that only has like 10, less than 10 minutes left to exist. So unfortunately, it doesn't give her much chance to prove herself. I think unfortunately, the show tried to balance two things out at once and they didn't know how to handle it well. It feels like the show tried to bring an issue that already existed onto the forefront without us giving much context. If you know nothing about the video games of Sword and Shield and just yeet Marnie's character into this, then all this comes off as is a prank was pulled on Ash that one time and this lady who uh, is worshipped by all these people lost a fight when she tried to prove otherwise. It's not good for her character. And the battle unfortunately doesn't do enough justice to help her out with that. That's the problem. That's the issue we run into. Not the fact that like, oh, she's a less experienced trainer than Ash and thus she has to lose, but at least she fights like while proving that she can hold her own in a fight without being like immediately swiped to the side i can see both sides it's just the one side that i'm on just happens to show the backup of the fact that one the episode doesn't give us enough time to marinate over it and two it all has to be balanced with Piers's debut as well as a battle which is unfair for marnie desdar says i still loathe how the duck was done in b's battle uh, like he put in some work, uh, put in so much work, not the uh, still loss, despite having a mini arc more so than Lucario. Again, yeah, that's another problem is that Journeys followed that formula of trouble, train, and triumph, and unfortunately, Farfetch got the worst end of the stick, no pun intended, um, where he ends up fighting. And sadly, Sirfetch ends up losing to Halucha, the same Halucha he lost to when he was a Farfetch, because the show has an agenda, and they don't want, like, Pikachu and Lucario to lose, because they're the more popular minds. Marnie's is Journey's How. Yeah, How was handled very terribly. And that's one of the reasons that I stated this tweet earlier, because I had another tweet that a lot of people commented on. Um, although, I will say that other one was a little bit more positively retweeted. Because uh, a lot more people agreed with me on that one. And that tweet in question was the one, and I'll go back and read it verbatim so that you guys have some uh, better context. Um, let me go back to it. It's quite far back, though, so give me a second. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, this tweet was done a while back, so I don't know if it, if I can find it soon. Oh, uh, where is it? 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 Yeah, because actually a lot of these tweets came in succession. I know the Flint one's been uh, retweeted a lot. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Oh, 
Oh, wow. Yeah, it's been a while. I think it's because I've gotten so many retweets since then. Jesus Christ. Uh... Oh, yeah, and then the opening happened, obviously. Mm. Is it this one? Ah, here it is. I said, you want to know what the PWC need, me, needed? More non-Ash battles. It doesn't feel like a tournament. It feels like a nostalgia gauntlet of Ash's old opponents with a sprinkle of new ones to make his battle number go up. I said that. And obviously, I didn't count Leon because Leon's like the goal, if I'm not mistaken. Leon's number one. So every other trainer is like aiming towards Leon. So when Leon battles, it's more or less to just show off that, hey, he's a competent trainer, which... I mean, the show's already did that by having him beat Lance and then having him uh, beat Raihan. We've already seen those fights. And Raihan's at least makes sense because it shows that Raihan has an open rivalry against Leon. We've, we've seen that already. That That's something that's already been pretty much established. But when I made that tweet, a lot of people were, a lot of people were actually extremely positive on that one. They retweeted and more or less agreed. I think there were only a few where uh, the statement was disagreed. But why did I make that? I made that because I stated that battling in and of itself tells a story, even if the battle doesn't have to be super in-depth. Imagine if w the world championships had started and we had seen, like, maybe a battle happening off in, like, the distance or something. Like, like they're, they're not the forefront, but we see a couple of battles happen happening on the side just to show that, yes, um, there are fights happening in the, in the world championships. Or we imagine a situation where... Um, or we go to a situation where we see a fight happening and uh, it's on TV and Ash and Go happen to watch a fight on TV. And again, these don't have to take a large amount of time. These would just be little sprinkles to help show that the world is building. Um, and then mix up the opponents a lot. If you're going to bring back characters, then mix it up. And that way there's more predictable things that happen where you don't know where the outcome is. Uh, there's a show, if you all aren't familiar, called Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, had a tournament known as the Battle City Tournament. And, um... It's time to... Uh, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Battle City Tournament, we see a lot of duelists are just dueling all over the city. Hell, they even make a joke out of it. Where one guy, like, has to stop his car because there's a duel happening in the middle of the freaking street. Like, that's funny. Um, but not even just that is, um... When you see that... You see that there's multiple things happening. And it doesn't just show Yugi's fights. It shows Joey's battle uh, duels that he's having. It even cuts to Bakura, where he's having a duel against, like, uh, a couple of the goons that were in Duelist Kingdom. Uh, we see a Shizu end up having a duel. We see, um, yeah, we just see a bunch of them, just different things. And why do they do this? It shows that the tournament is flourishing. We, we get to see all these different, like, things take place. Uh, let me read a couple of these comments before I move forward to, uh, to the point. Um, let's see. I remember that one. That would have been cool if it would have felt more stakes were going on. I think the issue here is as follows. Yes, battles can tell a story, but your entire issue is that you think uh, battles can only tell one kind of story. Uh, not at, No, not absolutely. You can lose a battle and still tell a story of how the character is uh, utilizing the battle. Like, for example, uh, in Barry's fight against Paul. That's always a good example. That's a really good example in the Lily in the Valley confer conference. Uh, it's something not tactical, but it can uh, have a story on you. But that's not how it works. There's a story narrative, an emotional narrative uh, that you seem to just not think that matters at all. False, uh, Kaito. Um, one of my favorite story fights where one of the characters loses, doesn't even involve Ash, is Paul versus Brandon. I like that fight a lot. I don't talk about it a lot, but I do like that fight. Why do I like that fight? Um, a couple of things happen in that fight that makes it very interesting. Um, you missed my point? No, I'm reading it. I'm tackling it right now. Um, that's one of my favorite points. Who wins or who loses? No, 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 no. I'm getting to that. It doesn't matter who wins or who loses in the Paul versus Brandon fight. And um, I like that fight. I like that fight a lot. It's, my, it's one of my favorite fights, actually. Um, and the re why do I like this fight? Uh, I like this fight because of the story that it tells, and not the tactics or the battle part. The battle part, the battle is just a battle. It, we can move that out the way. But look at what is happening in this fight. In this fight, um, Paul is fighting against Brandon. 
And Ash already made a comment on the Battle Pyramid before the fight starts, where Ash goes, it's the Battle Pyramid. And um, Paul goes, you know about the Battle Pyramid? And Ash goes, yeah, it took me a couple of times, but I beat him. And Paul goes, what? You beat him? This is very important. Because from the most part, we see that in most of Ash's fights against Paul, except the first one that they had, um, Ash loses against Paul. So we cut later, and we see that there's a fight that Ash can do that Paul can't. Why is that? Well, if we rewind back to AG, we learn that in this fight, just so let's we learned that in that fight, Ash used Charizard, Squirtle, Bulbasaur, and Pikachu respectfully. Pokemon that he's had the longest, that he's grown the closest bond with. This is his family. These are the closest related minds he has. And he beats Brandon with that team specifically. It shows that Ash's bond with his Pokemon overall triumphs. But Ash and Paul have different ideologies. Paul believes that, uh, that uh, Might is right. The stronger, statistically more powerful Pokemon is the one that's going to show the most optimal results. Yeah, Charizard jobbed, but that's not the main focus, High Prob. We'll get, we'll get to that point later. But it shows that might, uh, Paul's philosophy is that Might is right. His Pokemon are stronger, and thus he should be getting the better results. Ash's philosophy is it's the bond you gain with your Pokemon in order to give them the power necessary to win the fight. Ash's results show that he wins that fight. Paul's results, unfortunately, come up short. And that fight against Brandon. Brandon gets freaking destroyed. Uh, not, uh, Brandon freaking destroys Paul in that fight. To a point where Paul just starts doing, like, unnecessary moves. His tactics get sloppy. His attacks get all over the place. He keeps doing attacks that he knows full well aren't going to breach the defenses of the Pokemon he's got. His Pokemon choices start getting sloppy because it's very clear that he's losing. He's frustrated. Not just because he can't beat Brandon. And it's not just because his brother couldn't beat Brandon. Because that's what fueled him in the first place. It's the fact that Ash beat Brandon. A trainer who he stomped constantly and completely destroyed at the um and several different uh in different battles that they have the point is the fact that there's much more on the line than the fact that brandon can beat uh that paul can beat brandon it's the fact that he wants to prove that he can beat brandon just like ash already proved what's better friendship or statistic ideologies their characters are opposed of each other. They clash. And then Paul defeats Ash at Lake Acuity. Why is this important? Because it shows that the battles aren't just linear, black and white and forward. Ash is using a new team, yes, but he's using a team under the premise that this team in particular can gain the friendship and bond needed to defeat Paul later on. Which he proves when he beats Paul and not just defeats Paul. Winning isn't important. The winning part wasn't important. It's the fact that Ash wins using Infernape specifically. Because Infernape was the Pokemon that beat Paul. The Pokemon that uh, Paul casted out for not living up to the expectations that Paul had already placed on it. But through love, affection, and care, Chimchar grew into a stronger Pokemon, and thus in turn, the nomenclature is born. It beats Paul. It proves that under the right guidance, it can destroy Paul. Paul learns this lesson, and narratively, this moves Paul forward. Ash and Paul's overall rival arc ends here because it proved the point already. The story was told through the fights. The Brandon versus Paul fight. The uh, way this went way back in AG. The Ash versus Brandon fight. The Paul versus Brandon fight. The many fights that Ash had against Paul. The first fight that Ash has against Paul, they draw. They have a tie, which shows that they're equals to the very least. And then later we see that Paul has the one up, but that's because he's approached things statistically, which have the results. But through love and affection, the training that Ash follows, this stuff takes time. It can't be done overnight. The results grow, and we see that tactic. That's a story being told. 
That's a narrative. I don't get on journeys for their battles, not just because, oh, I'm mad and I only look at things through one one lens or whatever. I get I get upset when I look at these things and see that statistically they've been done better. That the story's been written better narratively in terms of how fights are done. Even if you look at a, a, a series as battle heavy as X and Y, you see it. Ash and Pikachu fight off against Karina and Lucario more than once, by the way, and they lose all their fights. This fight isn't just a rivalry between Ash and Karina anymore. This is a rivalry between Pikachu and Lucario, and we see that Pikachu's more pumped up in the fight. During the middle of it, Pikachu lets out this huge thunderbolt, not to hit Lucario, just to show that he's ready. It's a battle cry. It's him getting amped. Ah! It's him powering up. <laughs> So he can get ready to fight. He is amped. He is pumped. He is ready to prove that he can take on the exact same opponent on that level. He is amped up. And the story shows that. Unfortunately, the other stories go through a formulaic display where here we have the trial, tra training, and triumph. Ash doesn't train immediately after losing to Karina and beats her right after. Here we see all different levels of, uh, of style. Ash and Pikachu lose to Lucario at the first. They show that Karina is at least competent. But unfortunately, Karina's too uh, hell strained on the fact that she's winning. Keep in note, this happens. Uh, this is important for later. Um, but what ends up happening later is that it's very clear that Karina and Lucario are too focused on moving forward. They don't take the time in order to assess their situation. So when Lucario Mega evolves into Mega Lucario, what ends up happening is that he loses control because he's too hyped up. He's too amped. He's too much. Way too much is happening way too fast. Karina's expecting all this growth to happen right away. You even see it during the cutscene that she has with her, grand, uh, with her grandfather, Gherkin. When Gherkin tells her what she needs to do, she rushes off to go do it without actually taking the time to accept it and analyze the situation. So unfortunately, what ends up happening is because they're so hell-bent on becoming stronger, yeah, they have the strength to back it up, but they don't have the discipline. And it's that lack of discipline that causes them to lose control of the Mega. Pikachu fights against Lucario several other times. It loses a bunch of different times. They don't, Ash and Pikachu don't go through a training montage in order to beat him either. They, they lose, but it's because they learned a lot more during their half that they're able to understand Karina more just based off of how she battles. They worked off of each other. When Karina finally is able to humble herself and slow down a bit, Lucario becomes much stronger as a unit and is able to gain control of his mega evolution. And it's through that control that he's able to perform. He's able to knock out Halucha. He's able to knock out uh, Fletchender. And then later, uh, he's able. He's also able to fight off Team Rocket, but uh, that's Team Rocket. And then we see a good fight between Pikachu, Pikachu and Lucario. It's a good, balanced fight now. Now we have our, have, our, um, have our setting. Now we have our course. Now we have our, our seven episodes of build-up. That leads to a much better fight. The story, the context, is better. Here, unfortunately, and I know Kaito brought up the B situation. And the B situation, basically what ends up happening is Riolu loses. Because B is, better, uh, B is stronger with grab lock. Ash gets depressed. Well, they play it off as a joke. Ash has a problem fighting cephalopod Pokemon. Pokemon with tentacles. And then Go tells him to get your shit together, and then he finally does. And then after that, we end up in another fight where they draw to show that, yes, progress is happening. And then after that, uh, apparently Ash and Luke, uh, Riolu have a huge bond. Okay. Um, and he's able to Mega Evolve, despite the fact that Karina had more than seven episodes to do it, where Ash... And his Lucario for Mega Evolution training, at least. If we're, if we're talking Mega Evolution training exclusively, only had about two, maybe two episodes to practice on it. So, okay, I guess. And then after that, they fight. And Lucario versus Graplock isn't even that focused because they're not rival. Because they're supposed to be the rivals. 
But Machamp comes out of pure nowhere because Karina has him a champ. I mean, not Karina, B has him a champ. And then at that point, we see a Gigantamax Machamp lose to Mega Lucario because apparently Ash and Lucario have a huge bond. And the show has to keep telling us they have a huge bond where Karina and Lucario didn't really have to prove it. Like, you could see it. You could see it on screen. You focused on the narrative with other series, then you focus on tactics or journeys. No, I didn't. I said the narrative. The narrative was... If we had to break down Riolu's narrative, it was the fact that once it hatched, it was basically looking for a fight. Like, it basically sat there and tried to challenge others because it it wanted to find a train... Like, it wanted to find a fight worthy of it. Ash is... Ash, now with armed with a lot more knowledge than he did in the previous series, calms it down... And helps it, like, realize a little bit more of itself. It fights off against uh, Farfetch. And then once it fights off against Farfetch, uh, it doesn't... It, tie, it more or less puts up a good fight against Farfetch. And they're supposed to be rivals, but the show sort of abandons that. And at that point, Ash catches Farfetch on the idea that they were supposed to be training buddies. But the show doesn't do it. <laughs> it does it once and then sort of throws it away. And then after that point, we move forward. We don't get any... Well, let's look at the episode list, actually, because I keep the episode list on, on backup just in case that happens. Uh, Ash got Riolu in episode... Uh, 21. 21. So we move from 21. We don't really see Riolu have a major role again until about... Uh, until about 27. 27, because it fights Fl uh, Fletchender. After that, it doesn't really do much. Not really much is focused on it until episode 34. 34, we see that it fights against Graplock to prove itself, um, but he loses. He, he gets stomped. We don't get much afterwards except him losing against a lot of cephalopod Pokemon right after the Pikachu episode randomly. Uh, so yeah, Ash suddenly decides after the Pikachu episode he's depressed. I, feel, I always feel like episode 35 and 36 need to be swapped. <laughs> It always feels like they're out of order. I can't shake it, but it always feels like they're out of order. And then we get the Alola episode, which should have been Ash's, like, like them uh, helping Ash get back on his feet, but they don't. So nothing comes out of it. 38 has nothing to do with Riolu. And then we get 39, which in that one, uh, Riolu has a draw with Graplock to prove that Ash has gotten his shit together episode after episode 36. So three episodes have passed, and he's a little bit back on, on focus again. And then the series doesn't really do much with Riolu again until about episode 44, where he fights off against uh, Chairman Rose and evolves. Why? Because he fuck it, evolves. Who cares? Then after that, he fights off against Mewtwo, which he gets stomped. But it's because Lucario's like the strongest Mon Ash has on his team right now. And that ep the Mewtwo episode is a problem in and of itself. Then Lucario has a buddy cop episode with Cinderace that doesn't really do it much justice. And then after that, we move forward, and Riolu, uh, sorry, Lucario doesn't get much spotlight afterwards. He doesn't really do much. He's not really, like, relevant. He's sort of, like, in the background all the way up until, let's see, we got Farfetch. That's his stuff. Dragonite gets some spotlight because the show remembers that he exists. Uh, Lucario's pretty much taking a backseat at this point. Doesn't really get much screen time. I think he gets some screen time again in the... In the Midsummer Night's Light episode, I think. Does he battle in that episode? Can't even remember. Oh, and then he, uh, and then episode 77 is where he gets his major fight against Luxray. And he wins that fight despite getting the tar kicked out of him. And then we don't get any more Lucario screen time until about 84. Where Ash suddenly decides it's time to Maggie evolve him. So, yeah. What a bond we got going for Lucario. Um, I know. And then after that we get 85, 80, and 86, which... That pretty much rounds out Lucario's whole Mega Evolution arc. That's pretty much it. That is the arc. Because they have a huge bond, apparently. But at that point, we that's where, where it caps off. That, so, that's... Uh, so, at that point, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much what's going on. Riolu had a decent role in episode 25. What was 25? Let's check it. Episode 25 was, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's where it beat Karina, I 
uh, that's where Riolu saw, um, that's where Riolu saw Karina's Lucario and gained inspiration. Which, at that point, he's pumped to battle, which I guess leads into 27. So, yeah, I'll give Kaito that one. That, that one, yeah, he did have Riolu watch the fight, so he gained some experience from that. That's fine. And then after that, he does the toughing it out. And in that episode, he fights Farfetch. And it feels like the show was supposed to have Riolu have a training buddy with Farfetch, but he doesn't do it. Even the opening has them train together, but it doesn't come into fruition later. Like, it doesn't... It, 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 the narrative was Riolu growing maturity and strength, uh, and his bond with Ash. Sounds like a spin... What else we got? He doesn't. He doesn't. Lucario and uh, Inceno is absent in Midsummer. Oh, he doesn't. Dang. And he trained his home region. Uh, Dracovish met Arceus, but he didn't. Also in BDSP uh, Winter, he got the kidnapped, and he gets uh, hold in his own region. Oh, damn! I thought Lucario at least had a role in that fight. Damn, that I forgot about that. That's. I mean, but that's how bad it is. The fact that you have to remember when Lucario was relevant in certain episodes. And the fact that you have to remember that, it's just like, oh, this isn't doing him much justice if you have to go back and remember those. Where here, we can see, like, very clearly that the show has... And I get it. I get what the show's trying to do, unfortunately. The show is trying to balance a lot of things at once, while at the same time bringing characters back, increasing Go's development... Koharu is suddenly relevant for some of these. You have to increase development for... Like, I'm not even going to sit up here and say that running the storyboard for a show is easy. Even for... Especially for a show like Pokemon, where the creatures that are caught have to have some level of, of character development so that you can be invested in them. But unfortunately, the way Journeys is treated is that it's trying to, to, to please everybody and at the same time doesn't get the chance to please anybody or only lightly taps what's needed to be tapped for the sake of, yep, we got it. Like, even if you break down all of those episodes that I just stated before, the most you can get out of Riolu is that he uh, is a eager fighter that's eager to go out and prove itself as a fighter. Ash has to make him humble for a little bit because Ash understands Riolu based on his aura. And then he does get inspired when he sees Pokemon of its kind like Lucario fight. But then after that, we get a whole lot of nothing all the way up until it's its necessary time to spotlight. That means we end up getting more screen time with it. And Pikachu, unfortunately, uh, regresses some of this character development in episode 30, where Pikachu gets mad that Riolu gets more screen time than it. So now we run into these situations where Pikachu, unfortunately, his character regresses because... I'm mad that you used Lucara, that you used Riolu more times than you used me in battles. And that's because Riolu and uh, Ash have an understanding that they want to fight tough opponents and get stronger. But Pikachu's always had that mindset with Ash too, so it hurts his character. So the show can't even balance it out without having to hurt another character. The way episode 30 probably would have benefited a lot better is if Pikachu had had a little bit of alone time with Riolu so that the two Pokemon can understand each other. But they don't. Pikachu never gets the chance to even, like, talk with Riolu or understand it. Riolu comes off as a jackass in its immediate debut episode where he doesn't want to reason with anybody except at the last minute where he suddenly decides to reason with Ash after Ash defeats an Onix in front of it. But we never get a moment where Pikachu sits down and humbleizes itself with Riolu. One of the prime examples, and one of the things KG brought up in the Pokepod one time, was that Pikachu always sort of like acquiesces to the babies of each of the uh, of the teams. Like, P like Pikachu usually is the older brother of the younger Pokemon. That's been his caring nature. And he's had that nature, and you can even retcon it and say he's gained that nature because he himself was taken care of uh, as a baby Pokemon by Kangaskhan. So naturally, he has a naturally caring nature to Pokemon like Togepi, Pokemon like Scraggy even, who Scraggy had the exact same personality as Riolu. If you look at Best Wishes, Scraggy always had this personality where it wanted to scrap against anything regardless of how big it was. 
It wasn't until the fact that, like, Ash helped, like, calm it down a little bit where it still wanted to pick a fight with things that were bigger than it, but it was a more admirable, comedic way of using it. We even see it in, like, the movies where Scraggy tries to fight Pokemon bigger than itself. Or when Scraggy uh, uh, is training with Axew because the two Pokemon are both relatively young and balance each other out. Well, until Axew winds up just becoming overpowered out of pure nowhere. Um, but for the most part, it was a buddy thing. You would see that Ash and Iris would camp out and then occasionally they'd have moments where they go, hey, let's train. And Axew and Scraggy would train off of each other because they're both baby Pokemon. That's a great way to tell that story. Riolu's story comes off as a Pokemon that has its head over its heels and then ends up finally calming itself down because Ash proved himself. And then afterwards, Riolu just sort of like, is just Ash's default Pokemon for a little bit. And then it evolves in Lucario, does its necessary Lucario stuff, and the show abandons him until it's finally time for Ash to go, oh yeah, that's right, I want to mega evolve it. Why? I don't know. I just want to. And then he finally goes through this mega evolution trial, which, yes, it's good that he at least he has to go through a trial, but it all lasts one episode, and it really is, like, something that's not easy to look at after you've seen what Karina's had to do in order to get her mega evolution together. And if you see, Karina grew up with her Riolu, and they both grew up together as Karina and Lucario. She even states that she's Luc uh, Lucario or soulmates, which makes the story flow better when you see what all they had to go through for the seven episodes that they had to develop her character and the results that we see it as, as it flows out through the story. Ash has Riolu and then suddenly decides, oh yeah, I want to mega evolve it. That's right. That's a thing I can do. Like it comes off so quick and it comes off with no context of its own. Even if we had a situation where, like, and this probably would have benefited from what I said earlier in my tweet, where more non-Ash battles need to happen. I kind of wish that Ash had watched on TV that B was having a battle in the Pokemon World Champions, where she ends up fighting against another trainer, and that shows off that she has the Gigantamax Machamp. And Ash goes, wow, just as I thought me and Lucario were getting stronger, uh, B has gotten that much stronger. We have to find a way in order to match her strength. But how? And then Ash thinks and goes, wait a minute. I know how I can do it. And then we cut to the episode. And then we see that, oh, Ash wants to mega evolve. It comes out of nowhere. Like, in XY had Journeys writing, he would have brought uh, back Charizard, uh, Gla uh, Glalie, Heracross, and Sceptile. Oh, if XY had Journeys writing, he would have just brought them back. Like, because they can mega evolve, I guess. I see what you're saying. I agree Gengar should have uh, been jealous after losing as much as it did. After being abandoned, it should feels insecure uh, about taking uh, L's. Uh, they literally gave it a backstory a uh, half of his aces. Yeah. The problem with, uh, with the what Gengar had was that it didn't, like, receive, like, it got abandoned by its old trainer. Ash doesn't really give it that much character development until much later in the series. Even if we look back at the list, which I keep referring to, and people probably wonder, oh, why does he bring up this list a lot, or why does he bring up the episode list? I bring up the episode list to, to show that I know what I'm talking about. That way I'm not just saying stuff for the sake of saying it. Ash catches, uh, Gengar is introduced in episode 16 and isn't caught until, yeah, no, it's caught the same, no, I'm sorry, sorry, let me, so let me go back. Gengar is introduced in... In episode 11, I'm sorry, he's introduced in episode 11 and is caught five episodes after. Um, he's not even seen until five episodes after when Ash finally decides to catch him. He gets his first battle two, ep well, yeah, two episodes afterwards um, in episode 18. And then he isn't seen again for the majority of the series except for the little pranks that he pulls. And he doesn't show up until episode freaking... Let's see. Oh, he doesn't show up until episode 25 when he ends up getting beat by Lucario. And then after that, he doesn't get any more episodes until about episode 43, where he's briefly used in order to fight off some of the Gigantamax mods that are in the city. He doesn't get any more screen time again until, except for like little pranks here and there, until about episode 77? He doesn't give a battle debut until episode 77, 
where he loses to like Lux Ray or loses to does he lose to Lux Ray or Rotom? He loses to Rotom, I think. Yeah, I think it's Rotom because he's a ghost type mon that can match up with uh, Gengar's ghost battle style. So yeah, he doesn't get a, uh, any screen time again until then. And then he gets a brief character moment in episode 85 where he meets up with B. And they have like a little powwow with the, each of their teams talking towards each other. Yeah, he has a brief a moment in the uh, sun in, in the Alola episode, which is episode 37. But outside of that, he doesn't get any real screen time again until that episode. And then he doesn't get a major uh, story-driven focus episode until episode 91 and 92. And then doesn't get his battle win until 99. Like, what? I'm sorry, that's just like... And again, I want to clarify something very well too. Pokemon doesn't have to always battle in order to have screen time. Like, battling or, like, even, like, character development. Character development doesn't equal, oh, how many battles have you won and or lost and your entirety of being in the series. Just being out, just hanging out with the crew, just being a part of the team or, you know, having some major screen time or anything like that. People harp on, like, X and Y for being the battle-driven episode, but you can even see that, like, if you look at it, uh, a mind can have episodes... Like Noibat, for example. Thank you, Kuro. You you hit it before I could even say it. Noibat had an episode where uh, when it hatched, it had a brothership with Alucha. And then it also had an episode where it had a, um, a, a race, a flying race against Starly. Now, it doesn't even win that race, by the way. It comes in second place. But it's good because it shows that Noibat went from a Pokemon that didn't know how to fly to being a, a big contender in a flying relay race. And it shows that his character was growing and that he was competitive and that he was, you know, learning things from other Mons like Halucha and Fletchinder. Fletchinder takes a very nurturing role during the entirety of that. It acts as like an, almost like a mother figure. It uses its flame body in order to help uh, hatch the egg sooner. Uh, it teaches Noibat how to fly along with Halucha. It even fights alongside it uh, with against Zapdos in the Zapdos episode. So it shows that even though Fletchinder doesn't have episodes focused on itself, Fletchinder grows as a character, and Noibat grows because it's inspired by the two other flying types that Ash has on its team. It even helps Luxray in guiding everyone to the Terminus Cave because it has the ability to see. Like, it's little moments like that that are non-battle moments that at least show that the series puts it into account. Like, you can see these things take place. Love how Cinderace and Lucario's friendship went nowhere. Exactly. Even that. And the fact that someone else had to say it, I didn't even think about it because I straight up forgot it. When's the last time one of Ash's Pokemon used an ability? Precisely my point. And the funniest part is that, like, Ash's opponents have even showed to use abilities. Like when Electrovire used Moto Dry, but Pikachu has yet to use Static. It's little things like this that I'm talking about when I talk about do battles tell a story or even when the story tells context of what the Pokemon's been going through. And I feel like Journey's unfortunately tried to stuff a lot of stuff into its plot at once to where when you see these battles for in general and you look at these battles, you don't feel as emotionally invested because none of these Pokemon have done anything necessary to make you invested. None of their characters have been explored. None of them have been expanded. Cinderace and Lucario, to me, it would, uh, have been the sloppiest duo I've ever seen in my life just because I get the idea. The idea was supposed to be these are Ash and Go's ace Pokemon that are supposed to represent them as a bat as battlers being put off against a lot of different trials. Major boss fights like Mewtwo. The problem here is... I even feel that, and I maybe I'm just crazy, but I've always felt that Score Bunny evolving into Cinderace is a, is a thing that happens way too quickly. Like, extremely quickly. Score Bunny evolving into Cinderace to me is something that happens extremely fast to the point where we don't get to absorb any of this real character. We don't get to explore it, and Cinderace just comes off as this mind that Go has that's utilized when Go needs a mind in order to fight. And if he's not using Cinderace, he's using Inteleon. And, 
and then Ash has Lucario because Lucario's about the same height and he's a strong mon that Ash uses. So when they're used, it just comes off as, oh, the Darkest Day plot happened way too early in the series. So now this has to take place right now. Lu Riolu has to evolve into Lucario in order to match up with Reboot, who has to evolve into Cinderace. So all of this happens extremely fast and extremely sloppishly. I miss when Score Bunny used to kick and uh, Ash and Go, when he was pissed, uh, kind of lost that with his evolution. Cinderace is just a dumb mind at this point. Oh, uh, not his starter. Yeah, pretty much. Um... You'd think that Sir Fetch would have been the first Mon out to battle based on his character. The duck that tries to call the shots when Ash isn't around, similar to Halucha. Exactly. like that, And that's the character that we're given from Gate. But unfortunately, the story doesn't take that, that approach. Because it's not handling its story with its Mons well. It's handling them as a checkbox. Like, we have to do this because it's necessary for this to happen. So when the Mons end up battling... If they don't don't live up to like their usefulness, they have to be thrown out for the sake of, oh well, his plot arc is over. I wouldn't be surprised if like Gengar doesn't get a major fight for real until like the, the until like six v six battles are pretty much necessary at that point. And I've even seen the the people in the comment sections always state it. Where in some battles, people will go, yes, this Pokemon lost, but at least it knocked out another mine before it went out. Or, oh, this Pokemon lost, but it was able to put up a good fight or injure the mine necessary in order to wipe it out. Hell, I've seen people even um, state it. Where people are disappointed at the fact that Gudra ends up losing to Bisharp. But remember the context of what happens after the fight. Gudra ends up getting a rain dance off before it gets knocked out by Guillotine. And that rain dance is the rain dance that powers up the water shuriken that Ash uses later in the fight against Bisharp when Greninja defeats it. It's that level of teamwork that allows them to show, hey, all of his bonds are used. Serena out what right says it after Greninja uses the water shuriken. Serena goes, oh, it was a team effort. She says it right after to show that yes, there is a story being told here with the fact that Gudri unfortunately lost, but it did contribute to the fight. It didn't just lose and be used as a slot that was knocked out. Gudra tied with Slurpuff, and uh, Sawyer had no intel on Gudra. But he did have, and he did have the type advantage. It shows that one, Go is able to adapt without having to write notes in the middle of a fight like he used to at the beginning of the series, and he's able to overcome... And it also shows that Gudra, while it has a type advantage, is still able to hold its own and put up a fight. Narratively, this is the story that's being told beyond them being knocked out at the same time. Also, what's the point of giving Go all the starters if Ace is just uh, is gonna be the one going to places in Project Mew thing? Grookey is just there. Yeah, and I think unfortunately they wrote it that way so that Go can represent the Galar half so that they can have representation. But unfortunately, representation doesn't do that well if the Pokemon that's being represented isn't being represented well. I've argued this a lot, and I know people may or may not disagree with me, but like I remember AG did that same thing where they gave Ash Trico so it can evolve into Sceptile, that's fine, and then May had Torchic so she can evolve it into Blaziken for contest, that's fine. Mudkip, unfortunately, got the worst end of this deal by being put with Brock, and that unfortunately meant that Brock didn't do as much that uh, during that region because Brock wasn't as prominent of a character because his character already existed for long amounts of time. So Brock wound up using a Pokemon and it just evolved once and didn't even get the chance to become Swampert afterwards. It just exists. It evolved into Marshtop. Yay. And then after that, it's not really utilized much. It... It's used here and there for when Brock occasionally battles, but the story has unfortunately pushed Brock to the backside a lot, starting here and then moving worse than Diamond and Pearl where they do it to an even larger degree. And Teleon being stuck in a cave for 24 episodes. Yeah, and that was... The, the idea, I see what they were trying to do with that too. The idea was that Drizzile isn't a socially inept Pokemon. It, it likes to keep on its own, so it's not going to see much like... It's not going to come out much. That's what the episode's trying to do. 
That's Drizzile's personality. It works. But unfortunately for the show, it doesn't do us as the audience well enough to know Drizzile's character development as a Pokemon. Um, the narrative was supposed to be that it's upset. One of the things that could have been an easy fix for that is if we, the audience, can get occasional cut-ins on Drizzile just to see how it's doing and just to see how it's holding up or the fact that if it's thinking about Go. That way, when we finally get Drizzile coming back out of the cave to evolve into Inteleon during his episode, we feel a lot more familiar with the Drizzile and a bit more comfortable with the idea. If we look back at the list, yeah, I know I'm referring to the list again. If we look back at the list and when these events take place, Go catch a so uh, Sobble in episode uh, 28. And it doesn't really do much outside of that. Doesn't really give a major episode to itself. Doesn't really do much outside of that until about episode 54 where it learns U-Turn. And then he doesn't really use U-Turn at all during any of that. So we get situations where we pass up time. Go catch his Grookey so Sobble's screen time is immediately thrashed down. And then in episode 62, he evolves because the show felt like it was time for that. And then retreats into a cave where we never see it again. We don't even see get to see clips of it. We don't get to see it at all. It's just sort of there now. And we see like one clip of it occasionally in one of the episodes. After that, we don't get much out of it until about the episode where it finally evolves. Episode 78. And if we're looking at it, that was 62 to 78. So we would get no screen time until then in Detective Drizzile. After that, we get nothing. The show gives us practically nothing, and we don't get to get anything out of it until episode 88, where it fight the, helps fight off against Kingdra. And it learned U-Turn for what reason? Yeah, the idea was, I guess, supposed to be that it's that's, that's his battle style, is that uh, Sobble isn't a direct fighter, but it can retreat because it's not like it is it's not social. It's not a social mind. So unfortunately when it fights, it has to retreat. But that's okay. And that was supposed to be its adaptability. Which is what I want to give it its fair shot at. See, I like I said, I always give these things its fair shot. I get where it's coming from. But the execution's terrible because the next time we see Sable, he evolves into Drizzile. So we never even get the moment of it utilizing that battle style. When he evolves into Inteleon, that's not even his battle style anymore. I don't even know if this thing still knows U-Turn. Does it use it? Does it have that ability? Does it have that trait? We don't know. We never see it. He fights completely differently after that. Didn't Mike it evolve in the Battle Frontier? Uh, yeah, he evolved during the Battle Frontier, and then after, after that, he's not used really much. Not to mention Koharu, after all that buildup, is going to do a contest. Uh, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt and say that she's probably just doing the contest as an, experience, uh, as an experience. I don't think that's like her solid goal. Um, at least I hope not. I hope that the show isn't uh, doing that. I just realized Go was offered the Kanto starters at the beginning. Is Go catching any other starters other than Galar? Uh, he wants to catch all the Pokemon in the world, but uh, he turned his nose at those Kanto starters. So I don't know. And I don't think the show knows. Because the show would have to lock down and think about that. Uh, in the more Peko episode, Driz um, uh, had maybe 10 seconds of uh, screen time with Raichu. More Peko ate its food and Driz uh, didn't mind. Oh yeah, that's right. Thanks, Ness. I completely forgot that happened. Really worried about Greninja returning after the re uh, what Infernape went through. And that's, again, what I'm talking about. Now, Death Star, let, uh, let's take a moment and actually talk about it. So, why do I get so worried about returns? Because we've been through this road before. We've been through this, this rigmarole before where I state that I'm concerned. Because that was another tweet that got, um, that got very uh, much negative attention, I'll say. When Clement and Bonnie returned and I said, they're going to mess this up. I was basing that off of how they were, all the other returns were being handled. The other returns weren't good. 
I felt like the other returns weren't good. You literally, if you watch the Pokepod and see how disappointed Polly is at Butch and Cassidy's return, you'll know that this comes from some level of merit. This isn't just us saying something. This is a legitimately looking at concern as to how these characters are being treated. Let's cut forward. Um, Death Star said, uh, you're, you're worried about Greninja returning after the Infernape thing. That is fair. Infernape has been treated very poorly during its return. It got completely smacked by Moltres. And yes, we know, it's a legendary mine. But in, let's look at Infernape's last battle and compare it to its current battle. The last time we ever see Infernape fight, what's its last fight? And I'm going to let the chat answer this for a bit because I want to read the uh, the answers. I just hope because uh, call her participating in the contest is just to see her giving it a try and not her actual goal because of personality. Uh, I would rather Koharu's goal be something more po non-Pokemon related that just happens to have Pokemon in it. That'd be cool. Uh, knowing journeys, they are 100% going uh, to stuff Greninja with Clement and Bonnie. Uh, yeah, like put it all in at once. Yeah, like have them share the screen time. I, don't, I wouldn't want that. Uh, Infernape's return just to lose while Dracovish learned uh, learn a fourth move and Surfetch has yet has has yet to learn a fourth move and Surfetch uh, is to learn Meteor Assault. Hmm. Not just Butch and Cassidy, but Dawn too. Exactly. Polly was so defeated, so KG was with the Z move. Thank you. Uh, in journeys for Infernape. Um. Okay, so. In the last fight, I'm talking. I'm not talking about journeys. I'm talking about in the last debut that Infernape did in Diamond and Pearl. Infernape get uh, does his last battle with Electrovire. That's the last fight Infernape gets to do. His final battle is against Electrovire. Like that is the last fight. How the last thing we remember from Infernape is that it defeats Electrovire. Yeah, Professor Oak talked about he's training with other fire types, but that's those aren't full-fledged uh, battles. Those are just, you know, what's happening in the background to show, like, a little, like, flavor text. It's almost like an epilogue of how Infernape is spending his time. So then the next time we see it, it gets completely smacked, and it also has to share its character. It has to share its character with Gary, of all people. So Gary is styling and profiling on Moltres, while Infernape, unfortunately, gets smacked to the side and completely thrown off. The story starts off as, like, this story of Ash looking for Infernape because Infernape's trying to prove itself as a fire type. But Gary shows up and completely steals all that character development and screen time. So Infernape is just a side plot that otherwise gets smacked to the side, and we never even focus on it. We never get a moment... What we say after the battle where Ash sits down with Infernape and Infernape is like slumping because it's upset about how it performed against Moltres and Ash goes, don't worry Infernape, next time we'll fight it, uh, we'll fight Moltres and we'll be even stronger or oh, next challenge we do will be even stronger or Ash just put Infernape on his team so that he can show off like how um, in future battles. That would have been good. And then Infernape be used in, uh, alongside Lucario in a battle against B. And we see like a cool, like, you know, Infernape fighting off first. And then later we see Lucario. Like, that's a nice setup for a plot. But it doesn't use it. Infernape is like sitting in Professor Oak's laboratory, sort of chilling. And you're probably thinking, well, Ash's six Pokemon are already with him. That's not the point. Professor Sakuragi's lab has shown that he has more than enough capabilities of showing off other Pokemon. So Infernape could have fit right in. If anything, it could have been a good thing to see Infernape interact with Go's Pokemon, like Darmanitan. It's a fire type. It's pretty powerful. That would have been nice to show off. Or Infernape could have been a nice mentor for some of Go's Pokemon. Cinderace would have been a great training partner, but they don't do it. They don't do. They don't tackle any of this opportunity. The minute Mo Infernape loses against Moltres. We don't even get to see Infernape anymore. It's done. The only Infernape we get to see is alternate reality ashes, which is there for some reason. I, I don't fucking know. I, that that one, I, I, it, it gets smacked down too, I think, in a fight. I can't even remember what happens with that Infernape. That's how bad that, that is. So I choose not to talk about it. Um, Obviously, they don't care and never will. Uh, what's up, Richie, by the way? Like, it's so sick, I don't care if you like the show or not, 
but legit, uh, it's pathetic that the famous YouTubers in the community who stuck uh, shit like Juicy Juice barely got shit from the people and shit on uh, legitimate criticisms about Jeremy's. I mean, hey, like I said, it all comes with the good and the bad. If you have criticisms or praise, I've always, I've faced it all the time. When I praised XY, I've even stated that there's uh, episodes of XY I don't like, and people will uh, immediately default and say, oh, you're just an XY uh, fan, and apparently XY can't do any wrong. Oh, no, XY has plenty of problems. They're just not out, they just unfortunately don't outweigh the pros that I've liked about the series. XY has a crap ton of problems. The fact that it's filler episodes are usually not good. With the filler episodes, there are some good filler episodes, but for the most part, they, they don't bat a good average. They don't have a lot of filler episodes. Um, and I also will say that when it comes to haphazard writing, they've stuck themselves in a bit of a corner sometimes uh, towards the end. They've made decisions that weren't optimal. Granted, they were under a time crunch, but at least there were their decisions to make and they made the best that they could with it. Are there better solutions that they could have done towards the ending of the series? Absolutely. fucking lootly But for what, what they've got, they handled it pretty well. I just know that it's not perfect. The Aaron's episode with, uh, with um, Bunnelby and Chespin, fucking terrible. The fact that they give Clement Chespin is unnecessary. The Chespin's a terrible uh, character that doesn't really like help benefit Clement's character at all. Clement's entire team is way more fleshed out than Chespin is, where Chespin just feels like the poor man's Oshawa. I have criticisms about XY. I just don't talk about him as much because it's not irrelevant. But going back to Journeys, when I point out these criticisms, I'm pointing them out because I've seen them, I've analyzed them, and I can make my analysis based on what I'm looking at. I'm looking at it, I'm referring to older episodes, and not just older episodes in the Pokemon series, I'm referring to episodes in the series itself, the Journey series, the series that we have been given. I've pointed out all the time that there's episodes in Journeys I actually do like. One of my favorites being a non-battle episode. I know, right? The non, the person who likes X and Y's, one of his favorite episodes, isn't even battle uh, heavy, isn't even a battle heavy episode. Who would have thunk, right? I've constantly stated that one of my favorite ep non-battle episodes, if we were talking about non-battle episodes for the very least, is the Kakuna episode. The Psyduck shit. Episode 57. Just because it's handled very well. Like, it's, it's, it, it's, it's got a, a nice feeling to it. it. It feels very good, and it helps flesh out a character that should have been fleshed out a long fucking time ago. I don't know why we're waiting until episode 57. And even, um... Um, the other guy, I can't remember his name right now, Rinji, Rinji, Ryuji, 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 uh, anyway, episode 93 was done, was handled very well too, 57 and 93 are good episodes, because they focus on character development for characters that are in the show, they are late, but they are good episodes, the Flabebe episode I pointed out was a good one, granted, I like it mostly because it, it, uh, it's a, mostly about Flabebe. You could have removed Ash and Go and we, we would have been fine. I, I think this was supposed to be the equivalent of like Go's Bye Bye Butterfree episode, but it's handled very bad with Go. It's handled very bad with Go. Most of the stuff you can watch, remove Ash and Go out of the picture and still be mesmerized by how well everything works. It's almost like a watching. It's almost like watching the world of Pokemon. It's like watching a Discovery Channel uh, episode of something, but instead of like people, it's just the Pokemon. So I've I pointed out there's good journeys episodes. I like the Erica episode. The Erica episode is okay, and to me, it feels like it feels like an OG episode, but but it's standard. It's harmless. I've always stated that it's harmless. Um, story though can be back. And I remember I stated the best, uh, just if we're going back on the topic of can a battle tell a story, again, my favorite battle episode for Journeys, battle-wise, is episode 18. Debatably, episode 12 comes close, but 18 is like the last time I enjoyed a battle in this show. What does that tell you? What does that tell you exactly about the series? Weirdly enough, one of the other episodes that I guess you could like arguably say is... Uh, Dreams are made of these, Ash and uh, Ash and Go, or Journey, uh, Go Towards Your Dreams, episode 20. The one where Ash fights the Meganium Trainer. Weirdly, I liked that battle. Why did I like that battle? I like that battle because, one, they use an original character, which they'll never use again. His name is Oliver, if anybody remembers him. Um, and the battle looks good. 
And Ash actually finds a way to find some strategy. And the kids are watching him fight because, you know, a couple of the kids end up hanging out with Ash. And it shows how much of a, how, how far he's come as a calm, cool, and collective, competent trainer. It does a good job. It does a really good job of that. But it's a filler trainer that's sort of hand ha uh, uh, ha like hand-fisted. And it happens all so quick. And he has to share that with a bunch of other things that happen. But for the most part... Fuck, I forgot about that episode. That's the problem, Two Steps. The problem is that that episode is forgettable. It's a good battle. It's just forgettable. But that's been Journeys' problem. Can you honestly say, go back and trim out all the come uh, the characters that have come back uh, and just focus on original characters, Go's development, and Koharu, and just like put those into the forefront for a second? Can you honestly say that you've remembered Journeys? And I'm talking carve out the comebacks. Let's focus on the bare things that Journeys had to give us. So that means, like, focusing on characters that are exclusively Journeys. Can you remember? Like, does this show hold up well? Is this show one of those things that people stop and think about and go, yeah, I remember that, or yeah, that takes me back to that episode. I had to tell y'all who Oliver's name was, and don't sit up here and say that y'all remembered it. The only person I could probably think that probably remembers that name is Kuro. No offense, I'm just saying. Kuro's probably the only one who probably remembered his name. Still the same to me as a mixed bag. Poor Saya. That's his Japanese name, I'm sorry. Yeah, Saya is his Japanese name. Oliver is his, is his English name, I'm sorry. Yeah, nobody even remembers this poor dude. You're right, though. He's just... He got Meganium, but Tokyo stole the spotlight. And, oh, let's talk about that. Because they're bringing Tokyo back, and I actually thought it was pretty cool that they brought him back. Because I, I almost liked that episode. I, I, <laughs> I know, right? A Go episode that I almost liked. That episode is episode 32, Time After Time. I actually almost liked that episode because it showed that, like, Go was going to reunite with this guy. And they were actually going to, like, we were going to see some legit character interaction and development between Go and a longtime friend of his. But you want to know what ruins it? The minute that he meets Tokyo, what happens? The episode ends. We don't even get the chance to see anything else. And we don't get, and you're probably thinking, well, we're going to see Tokyo later. Yeah. Yeah. Guess when we get a follow-up? Tokyo's last debut was in episode 32. We don't get to see him again until episode... Wait for it. 102. 70 episodes later. He's not talked about. He's not brought up. He's not in a cameo. He doesn't even make an appearance. This is the problem. When you try to carry all these things on your plate, when you try to carry the Zapdos plot, the Mewtwo plot, when you try to carry all this shit, all this way, and you try to hold all these things up, and you try to uh, do this. How many Pokepod episodes have we been through where TSS goes, well, they're coming back to it. Well, they're coming back to it. They're coming back to it. They're coming back to it. This isn't the last time we're going to see this. James got more Peko. For what? Who gives a fuck? The Zapdos thing. They're coming back to it. How many things have they come back to? The Ponyta thing. Koharu mentions it once. And that's it. They're supposed to come back to the Mewtwo thing. Remember when, remember when Go had an Aerodactyl? I sure do. Like, it's just... Bro. Ash has, Go has a Suicune. If y'all don't remember. Hodges returned for Absol, but he didn't do anything. Ah, uh, okay. I'll, I'll scratch that one. Koro, I'll challenge that one. He actually did do something. He, um, he basically stopped the villagers from doing what they were gonna do. Uh, to Absol. They were gonna actually head out to Absol. He, well, he bought time. Which, honestly, I felt could have been handled better. They handled it poorly. That's what the problem is. He did something. It was just handled poorly. 
So they're coming back to Visky's. No, Visky's is gone. I, we just have to unfortunately realize that Visky's is gone. Because I remember TSS even said that Visky's was supposed to be coming back. She doesn't come back. That's it. Like, that's the last time we see her. Like... It's very clear this show went in a lot of directions and doesn't know what it wants to do with itself. And that's 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 the sad part. Not the fact that it that it um not not even the fact that it um is poor execution. It tried to execute in different areas so many different times and finally got its shit together. Project Mew is only four as of right now is only four to five episodes long. And Go just decided that he wanted to do Project Mew in episode freaking... Project Mew didn't even become a thing until episode 68. And people want to give Serena shit. At least she got an idea of what she wanted to do by episode 40-something. But Project Mew doesn't get executed till 68. And again, the show has stressed. There's no rush in trying to figure out what you need to do. Obviously. But Project Mew sounds very important. Towards Goal's goal, specifically. Why? Because it's called Project Mew and Goal's goal is to catch Mew. If there was anything regarding Mew, that should have been his first objective. But no, it doesn't even come up until episode 60, funky ass 8. A whole project devoted to teams of people trying to capture Mew, or at least learn about it, and it doesn't show up till 68. And Go states that he wants to catch Mew in episode 2. That's the, y'all see the problem now? They said one bum friends, everyone got, still saying, hey man, I pay you back a month later. Poor Cynthia gonna get stomped by Lucario and company and not the DP team. Oh uh, yeah, that's, that's another problem too, is that, um, I think if we want to get back on the topic of battles real fast, I think the biggest topic also is when Ash beats like people that have come back He's beating them essentially with minds that he just picked up versus minds that have had that journey with him. And the show has been very hell-bent on Ash bringing back uh, old companions, seeing old companions, but not bringing back older minds. But this is, the, this is the sacrifice you make. You want to bring back old regions, and you want to bring back old characters, but then that also means you want to bring back old minds like Ash have bringing back uh, Infernape, but you don't want to develop them on the same degree as you develop the minds that Ash currently has. But the problem is the show is also trying to balance out go catching all these multiple Pokemon, being a part of Project Mew, being a part of um, being uh, Koharu's plot, the plot of her discovering different Eevees, and then doing random filler episodes to show things off, building the development between uh, re between uh, Renji and uh, not Ryuji. I'm sorry. Ryuji and Kakuna, um, as well as no de Sakura, uh, Professor Sakuragi uh, hasn't had any development himself at all, for real. Um, then you're trying to balance all of that out with bringing back all of these old things. You don't bring back any of Ash's old bonds, for real, except for a cameo where he hugs them all very briefly. And then after that, what do you do? The reason that we were so attached to his older minds is because Ash would be able to bring his older minds back for certain situations in order to fight off against the situation and grow as characters. But they don't even bring back his older minds for that except for Infernape, who ends up getting one-shotted real fast. They're going to bring back Greninja, but unfortunately Greninja is going to get one episode probably to show off his character. And then in order to have his other minds get spotlight, he has to like relinquish it. Remember, Ash's minds on his current team barely have any development outside of maybe Lucario and Pikachu. The rest of the minds have had very situational moments here and there, but not really much character development outside of little running gags or the occasional appearance where they pop up and leave, where they don't really contribute much. So in battles, it's hard for people to really feel anything for when Ash uses like these barely used mons 
versus mods that he uh, went through an entire journey with. When he was on a journey and he was with these mods, you had little moments where he got to build relationships with these mods here and there. Gib Gibble isn't one of my favorite of Ash's mods, but I remember it a lot better than I do any of the mods he has here. Dracovish tries to do the biting Ash's head joke, but I don't feel as emotionally attached to it because Ash doesn't use Dracovish as much. Not even just for battle situations, just in general. I think the only time we've seen Dracovish used was twice. Once to help put out a fire, and the other time to help build this ice thing during the Regina episode. And that's about it. That's the only time it's really used. Gibble, on the other hand, has had multiple episodes where it's training to use Draco Meteor, but it hits Piplup. And then a couple of times it doesn't feel bad for hitting Piplup because he's a jackass. But Togekiss finally scolds him for it, and then he feels bad for doing it. And then Gibble has a running joke where he tries to become a better Pokemon for Ash, but he still bites Ash's head because he's affectionate towards Ash. You can remember that. I haven't watched Diamond and Pearl in, in, in years, but I can remember that. Why is that? That was Arctas and Dracovish in the Vaporeon water race. Oh, yeah. Journey 3, they have Go, Gym, and Ivy Sword Tower, but they didn't uh, divide deep, with dive deep within that. Like, it's just, the fact of the matter is, and just to end it off to, by going back on the topic, when we talk about do battles tell a story, yes, they absolutely do. Does Journeys do a good job tell, having these battles tell a story? Not necessarily, because we haven't had any time. The Journeys has tried to hold so many things up at once that we don't even have a time to sit down and really enjoy the Pokemon that are on the current roster. The biggest problem has also been the fact that Go has caught all these Pokemon, but hasn't grown emotionally attached to any of them for real, with the exception of the starter mods that he has, and even those, their character development has been very, like, here and there. And then when he doesn't have development with these, between the Pokemon that are here and there, he also, he has to, like, balance it out with the running gags that some of these Pokemon have. He does have some episodes with Pokemon where he legitimately tries to get connected with them. But they're so far and few between because they have to share themselves with other things. This is what happens when you have a show with a character that wants to catch a bunch of Pokemon. Combining that with a show where you want Ash to revisit a lot of older regions. And revisit a lot of older uh, characters that he's met once before. It's too much. The show has to play the balancing act by carrying all these things at once. Remember episode 15, A Snow Day for Searching, where Go caught this Cubone and gained a huge development with it? So obviously Cubone should be one of Go's ace mons, right? Or at least one of the main ones he uses. Nope, Cubone hasn't had a major appearance at all since episode 15. So it feels so hard for me to, like, feel anything for it. And you can even make the argument, Go's not a battler. That's fine. But you probably are wondering, why'd you put up this picture of the Go eyeing Hodge and the Ash and Karina thing and all that? I put this picture up to show that there was one episode where Go did participate in a battle tournament. And then in that episode, he lost the battle and got upset by it. Does he utilize himself afterwards? Do they really do anything with it? Do they double down on it? No. That was episode seven. And they don't do much with it afterwards. Yeah, he ends up fighting a couple of times and is a little bit more competent, but that's because he has to be at this point. The show has put him in a situation where he has no choice but to be as strong so he can keep up with Ash. But he's never gained any battle abilities of his own. Most of the major battles he's in, Ash has to be basically accompany him. We've never seen a moment where he battles a trainer head on by himself, except for Oleana. And he wins that because Reboot has to evolve into Incender, uh, Cinderace to keep up with Lucario. So the show doesn't even handle that well. Also, you'd think in the PWC has a shaky foundation. You would think Leon would feel bad and Rose and Oleana used him as a pawn and could have rigged things. They don't use that at all. They, I completely forgot about Rose and Oleana you, uh, until we had to bring it up for example purposes. Poor Cubone got shafted like Koharu's Yamper. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think it's safe to say that at this point of the series, it's officially the 100th episode 
that that is the worst of the series of the franchise. Uh, wish there was Leon missing episodes where he goes all around and uh, like a nomad. That would actually be a good idea. Didn't go win his first off uh, battle off screen. Oh yeah, I completely. Pre you want to know what episode that is? Let's go back and do our research. That episode is episode. Um, shit. What episode is that? It's episode thirty four. Go beats the trainer, which allows him to get Hitmo Chan. But we don't even get to see it. Bro, what? What? They off screen goes first major battle win. Like this, bruh. So the first time he has conflicts with battle is in episode seven. We zoom forward episode uh, thirty uh, all the way up to episode thirty four, and we don't even get to see the fruits of his of his labor. It's it's treated as a side plot for Ash to lose against B. Like what? And that's a major thing. It's like what in the world, bro? This. This is this is garbage, bro. And like, holy shit, I forgot that happened to Ryan. So the fact that we, how many times have we said holy shit, I forgot that happened during the stream alone? And I'm not doing this to vicariously pick on journeys. I'm doing this because it it brings up a point. This is the series that we're currently watching right now, and people barely remember what's happening in it. If you, if the series is giving us so many things that are so forgettable, if so many things, and I'm not saying this, again, I'm not saying this to make a straw man's argument here. I have given things that's fair shot. I've pointed out in the stream, you can see earlier, I pointed out my favorite episodes. I pointed out some of the things I like, but I've also pointed out the things I don't like, and unfortunately the things I don't like have piled up because most of the stuff is stuff that either A, was poorly done, or B, I forgot happened. Off screen lands, poor character development, side shafted characters. These are things that we've been seeing continuously happen throughout the series. Even through this chat alone and through the Twitter comments that I've seen, people have been going, man, I wish this character would gain some development or, oh, I wish this character would get some spotlight or, oh, I wish this Pokemon would be utilized in battles more or, oh, I wish Go would use this Mon more or, oh, I completely forgot this happened or I forgot this trainer existed or I forgot this character existed or I forgot this battle happened or I forgot that Go caught fucking Suicune. That when so many people are saying this at once, it means there's a problem. And if you like the series, perfectly fine. That is great. Live your best life. I am making constructive criticisms. And that's where we start our little, that's where we spark off our issues. Is that when I go to, an, uh, to analyze and review something and I... Uh, and passionate about the review and I give it a negative score or I give it a low score or I give it something. First of all, I want to point out when I'm giving these scores, I'm not giving all the scores a zero, guys. Like, I hope you guys don't think I'm giving every Journey's episode a zero out of ten. I varied the scores. Most of the scores have been, on average, a three out of ten or a five out of ten for the most part. We get the occasional two out of tens and one out of tens for the ones that I really don't like. And we've gotten the sevens out of tens, the nine out of tens, and the occasional ten out of ten from me. So it shows that I'm varied. It doesn't even show that I'm not, I'm just being completely biased here and giving journeys an unfair shot. But for the most part, my scores have been either average or below average for a reason. I'm not trying to just like hopelessly hate this show for the sake of hating the show. I'm giving it its fair chance, and I'm judging it based on what I'm seeing. I know a lot of people have stated, oh, you complain about it, you complain about it. It's not complaining if I'm giving constructive criticism on A, what I want, the fact that I don't like it, B, the fact of what I don't like, C, how, uh, my thoughts on how it could have been better, and um, D, the re re referencing the show and the series itself so that I'm actually citing my source. Those four steps are the steps that I take in every time that I review the episode and, and analyze it. The fourth one's important because I'm using the show itself as a backup, as a way to show that, yes, I'm using the source materials in front of me to make my analysis and not just some angry headcanon that's off the top of my head. 
I'm using the third source here to show that I'm making the analysis on what could have been better, not just so that I can Monday night quarterback. I'm using the third source to show that there is potential here. To show that the show isn't hopelessly giving us crap just for the sake of giving us. It's got ideas. Because the ideas aren't just utilized to their fullest potential. And then when I uh, observe it and break it down and analyze it, I'm doing it to show that I am paying attention to at least what's happening to show that I'm not blindly saying that something's bad without giving it a chance. But I've talked enough. I've taken up two hours of you guys' time on uh, the fact that battling to me in this series, just to round it out, battling to me in this series hasn't been well handled. Not even the fact that it's not visually well, because unfortunately, I will say, that I will admit this, and this is my fault, visually I'm spoiled by Pokemon battles from X and Y. X and Y unfortunately spoils a lot of us in terms of what a battle can look like. That's unfair. That's completely unfair. Um, Yeah, the X and Y just unfairishly is is just in its own league of battles. That's, God damn it. But um, I also say this, because I want to show that these battles, these, these, the fact that this series is bold enough to say the world championships, right? That's a big event that takes place across the entire world, ex except for Gen 9, because that doesn't exist yet. Um, and you and have the gall to say this is a tournament that happens with all the regions. And then the way that they handle the battles are very piss poor, predictable, poorly executed, or just haphazard. And then we get moments like these where I have to sit down and talk about them pretty much shows what I'm talking about. It's not me just complaining for the sake of complaining. It's using what the resources we have for a series that's bold enough to say we're going to take one trainer that's unbeatable, put them up against everybody, or put them up against everybody, literally, so that they can rank up, so that they can get up to the chance to fight them and keep his rank up. Start an entire ranking system tournament that involves everyone across the world, except for Gen 9, and then have the gall to not handle these battles well because, A, most of the battles are only Ash and Leon, and when the battles do happen, they happen so haphazardly with very little uh, attention to narrative detail, structure, or character development and are only shown to have the Pokemon have a number that they can say, hey, look, this Pokemon won this battle. You see, the show has shown the squiggly eyes, so thus they have to have uh, one out of ten losses or one out of ten wins or whatever. It doesn't feel... Journey's had a battle fest. Wait, what? Episode 25? What was that? What was episode 25? Oh, yeah, the festival. I completely forgot why that happened. But the festival ties into the world championships, too, which unfortunately, like, puts Karina there. And then when Ash and Karina fought, this gets even worse if you really stop to think about it. When Ash beat Karina, it stepped him up to, uh, to super class, if I'm not mistaken. And then when Ash fought Karina and made it up to super class, he ended up losing against B, and then he lost against some nobody, some random nobody trainers, which bumped him back to master class, which means Karina lost for no damn reason. Which means her fight was pointless. I. And then when we see Karina again, we don't know what rank she's at. She says she's aiming towards Leon too, but what's her rank? How does she fare up? Is she going to fight B again? Is she going to fight any of the other trainers? Is she done? Was she just here to teach Ash how to Mega Evolve because he doesn't know how to do that? Or like, the show doesn't tell us anymore because the show doesn't care anymore. It's interesting to see that other trainers are here. What about Iris? Is Iris still in the tournament? Who knows? They showed her. This is why Ash didn't lose to Volkner, not to devalue, uh, not to not devalue Iris. Yeah, pretty much. Go and Cinderace, uh, go to Winden a lot, but they don't even visit, uh, the Nickets. Yeah, because they forgot the Nickets exist. That plot's done. Uh, Ash did have a Pokemon World Championship match that wasn't in Kanto or Galar. Did he have one? Uh, yeah, he had one in, Cal in Kalos. Honestly, Ash beating Paul again, what's that gonna prove? Thank you. 
Thank you, Death Star. You, 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 you. Dropped it. Dropped the mic. Drop the mic right there. Damn, son. Where'd you find this? Thank you, Death Star. You proved my point exactly, actually. L let's... No, Death, Death Star is absolutely the fuck right. He is absolutely right. Good job. You, and I'm, this, this isn't me being sarcastic. I legitimately mean Death Star proved a really good point. What is it gonna prove? Their rivalry ended in Diamond and Pearl. What? What? What, what is there to gain? <laughs> well, do you feel emotionally that the battle that Ash has with Paul back then is gonna be is is gonna do you I'm sorry let me rephrase that question I'm sorry <laughs> do you feel the battle that Ash if let, let's say Ash fights Paul again in this tournament do you feel the battle that Ash has with Paul is gonna have the exact same level of emotional meaning that it had in Diamond and Pearl that's my question do you feel like that's going to be the case? Is Volkner still in the tournament? The show doesn't give a fuck, so who knows? Didn't Paul beat Ash two times, though? Paul beat Ash multiple times. I can't remember all of them. Is Ash going to get another, uh, in another funk? The show's way too late for that. We way, we way too late for that. Hell no. It'll only be interesting if Pikachu and Torterra spar. No, Ash only beat Paul once. Yeah, he only beat Paul once. But emotionally, that one time was the time that mattered. It was the time. One, it was the Pokemon League. So Ash was able to advance in the tournament and become top four in that league because of it. And two, Chimchar's the one that beats Electrovire in that fight to show that under the right tutelage, Infernape was able to win against Paul, despite the fact that Paul disowned uh, Chimchar for its lack of battle potential. So, emotionally, that story's over. Ash could use Infernape to fight Paul again, but it's, it, they did that already. Like, there's no point in doing it twice. It'll look nice. I mean, but it ain't gonna do much. Unless Ash is ready to give Infernape to Paul again. Which, I don't think the show will do that. They're not even gonna... That'll be a level of depth that no one's ready for. That I can already tell how many people will complain about that shit. Ash's Alola team is rotting in Kakui's house. Pfft, yep. Yeah, I doubt they're gonna... And which is sad, because Ash got Incineroar, and technically, uh, it didn't get to fight as an Incineroar. It fought as a Toracat. But that was fine. I mean, if you ask KG, KG even says that's a good end for Incineroar, is that he was able to evolve winning a fight against its rival. That's good. All it can do now is, if it, it joins the tournament at this point, is lose. Um, Ash low-key repping Alola. Uh, and Ash is low-key repping Alola. Literally no one else in the PWC is from there. No one in Alola has competed in the tournament. That, bro. Elola, uh, Alola is mid. Yeah, you would think that, actually. You would actually think that. You would think Kiawe would enter the tournament. Or, like, Gladian. Oh, bro, this is right up Gladian's alley. But I don't know if the show still wants him to look for his father or not. Every person in from every region is supposed to be entering this tournament. But what have we gotten? Does this... Uh, let me ask. Does this feel like a tournament? Does this feel like a tournament to anybody? That's the main that's the main question I should have asked on Twitter. And I probably should ask that right uh going into it. Does the does the PWC feel like a legitimate tournament? And I think I might uh end the stream and ask that question uh when we get off. Is does the PWC feel like a tournament to you? Does it feel like a straight up tournament? And I talked with a couple of others, uh, and Torrell brought this up too, um, a couple of nights ago. Um, where he brought up this really good point. Guess which tournament? Guess what? Guess what made Best Wishes? Guess what Best Wishes' biggest uh positive was? And it was a tournament too. But you already know what it is. Everybody knows what it was. And not that I'm not talking about the league or the PWT. The tournaments. Thank you, High Prof. KG, I think, said this in uh, during the reactions. But the club explosions, the uh, the tournaments, the little the those 
the character came in. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. It was the fact that we got to see these characters interact and it made the tournament feel more full when the battle it's the battle club explosion the tournament all of those things those allowed us to be in depth with this world here we get ash versus um some character or ash versus leon it was fun thank you it was fun and i hear so many arguments when i bring this up is oh well uh, you just want battles for the sake of battles. Uh, that, that Isn't that pandering? Is it? No. What that would do is that that helps build the world and make it more to life. The plot of this series is the world championships. That means the tournament is the selling is one of the selling points of the series. If the tournament is one of the selling points of the series, then shouldn't we show off the tournament? Doesn't that make sense? Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm wishing for too much. Maybe I'm just begging for something for the sake of complaining. Who knows? But for my perspective, if a tournament takes place and the main selling point is, as the narrator said, anybody can enter the world championships. It doesn't matter how many badges you have. It doesn't matter what league you came from. It doesn't matter what your ranking is. Elite four members, gym leaders, uh, frontier brains, Anybody has the ability to enter the tournament. Okay. Can we see the anybody of the anybody? I'm just saying that would make for interesting setups. Look at how cool it was that we saw like um, Langley fight off against like, like um, we got to see Langley fight off against Iris in a tournament. They scrapped. And then we got to see Burgundy uh, fight off against, uh, like, Ash or whatever. Or, no, we got to see Langley fight off against Ash. That's not even Ash's rival. It's Iris' rival. But it was cool because we got to see, like, different rivals fight different other people. Or Silent fought Trip, and he won! Silent fucking won! But that was cool because it made it, like, Ash went, oh, shoot. Like, Trip is uh, hard for me to beat, but apparently Silent got this down. That makes him competent as a gym leader. And then we uh, flash forward, and then we see, like, uh, Silent fight off against Burgundy and curb stomp her, but, you know, we see that. But then we see another fight where Burgundy fights off against, like, Bianca, but Bianca wins that fight, and St uh, Stefan fights off against Bianca, but he wins that fight, but Ash fights off against Stefan, and they end up fighting, and it's like, you get all these fun little crazy mixes. You get to see all these cool little combinations. And it and it and it builds the world. This is the tournament arc. This is a tournament. That could be easily done with characters in battle tournaments. Man, I wish, bro. Uh the ranking doesn't matter until they do. Yeah. Uh like like and I've done ranking tournaments before, like in real life. And like when you play the game, the the the, the Switch game. I've done ranking tournaments before. Hell, the uh, the entirety of the uh, Sword and Shield, that's a ranking system. That follows a ranking system, not a bracket. Um, but this, this, this tournament feels honestly all over the place. Most of the fights that, had, that take place to get Ash up in his rank are off screen. We don't even get to see them. And then finally we see a couple that matter, which that's fine. Not every fight needs to be recorded. But the ones that we do see matter... They boost Ash up to dramatic rankings that make no sense. We don't get to see any other trainers fight off against any other trainers. Ash ends up fighting either nobodies that are forgotten, or he ends up fighting reoccurring characters just for them to lose quickly to a team that he barely has any interaction or chemistry with himself. And then the only other fights we get to see are Leon, which to me are redundant fights because Leon's already number one. Everybody already states that Leon's at the top. He's the cream of the crop. But we see him end up uh, beating like these nobody trainers. Uh, what's up, XX Triple uh, X Gamer? Then, uh, Than, uh, Ethan, Gamer is it Gamer Ethan? What's up, Ethan? Triple X Gamer Ethan. So uh, we we see him end up uh, fighting. We see Leon end up fighting people, which is almost redundant because he's already at number one. He's already top dog. So a lot of these trainers are just coming up so that they can get the piss knocked out of them. And then we see Ash end up fighting majority of the trainers after that. We don't get any mix-ups. We don't get to see Valkner 
uh, challenge, like, the episode before, we could have had Volkner fight off against some other trainer. Also, thanks for the, uh, follow, X Gamer. Uh, I appreciate it. We don't get to see, like, uh, Volkner fight off against any of the other trainers. We don't get to see Iris fight off against, like, another dragon trainer. Like, well, how cool would it have been if we saw Iris fight off against, like, Claire in the championships? Or against Lance? That, bro, Lance was already in the tournament. It would have been cool if we had saw, like, she used Haxorus and, like, she Dynamaxes it and it beats, like, Dragon her. Or, like, Iris uses her Dragonite against Lance's Dragonite and they have, like, this cool little Dragonite fight. Or the fact that uh, Iris caught a Gibble one time so it evolved into Gabite and fights off against somebody else. Uh, and Ash goes, wow, Iris has really gotten strong. And then we cut to Iris inviting Ash to battle. That's smooth. That's a transition. That's a nice story. That's storytelling. Oh, we see, like, um, we go in and we see Hal. And, like, let's say Hal's in a fight from Sun and Moon, right? Hal ends up fighting. And um, Hal ends up in a battle. And one of the Pokemon goes to sleep. And the judge is about to call the battle. And Hal goes, no, stop. They're not knocked out. And then the Pokemon wakes up, and they fight, and Hal wins. And, ha and uh, the tra he shakes the trainer's hand, and is like, I didn't want you to lose like that. And it's like, oh, that's cool, because in the, in the sun and moon during the league, he almost won that way, but it didn't work out. Are you taking game requests? Um, for which games that you, you want me to stream, yes. Uh, this month, we're doing Dual Monster March, so we're mostly doing Yu-Gi-Oh! content, and we're doing Monster Hunter content. So we're going to be doing Yu-Gi-Oh! and Monster Hunter content for uh, for this setup. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to open up a poll for which Yu-Gi-Oh! game that people want me to play next week for Duel Monsters March. So on Wednesday, I'm going to be playing a Yu-Gi-Oh! game. I just want to put up a poll to let people uh, know which Yu-Gi-Oh! game people want me to play. Because I'm going to be doing that for Duel Monsters March. Um, but yeah, back to the topic at hand. That would have been cool if we got to see something like that. Like, oh, that's cool. We get to see, like, these ca uh, characters growing. Now, that's how you tell that story. How was done extremely wrong in his story. But here, did you see the Journey's opening four? Uh, yes, I did, River Otaku. I actually commented, I, visually, I think the opening's good. I've already stated that. Visually, I think the opening's good. Does that have anything to do with the story we've been given? Absolutely not. Um, Greninja returning, I, it's there, I'm not really hyped about it, really, like, I think it's okay, like, oh, cool, Greninja's back, but I don't really see a reason it needs to come back, it's, it's not gonna benefit its story, if it comes back, knocks out a Pokemon and leaves, it's just gonna, like, okay, cool. Paul coming back, we've talked about that, I like the visual that they have with Paul coming back, but again, if Paul comes back and Ash beats him again, it's like, okay, so... <laughs> like, that already happened. Who cares? It feels odd that uh, none of Ash's minds have heard about the... Uh, that none of Ash's minds have heard about the PWC, despite it being broadcasted all over the world. Charizard doesn't want to fight Leon's Charizard. Yeah, because apparently Charizard doesn't care about stuff like that anymore. Remember when Charizard would randomly, like, watch TV and see what Ash was up to? And then he would, like, if he would see that Ash, like, struggling, he would go out there and go, like, find him himself. Or Ash would make a request for him or something like that. Hell, even in Pokemon the Movie 3, when he saw that Ash was in trouble, he flew off to where he was. Like, let's see how uh, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon were both good games. Ah, I like the vanilla Sun and Moon more than Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Only because of the story. Like, Sun and Moon, to me, told a better story than Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Uh, Difficulty-wise, I will give that to Ultra Sun, though. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are harder. I will say they're harder. They're a challenge. But vanilla Sun and Moon tell a better story. Um, But to round this up, because we're approaching the end of the stream, honestly... That's the question that I have to ask you all. Currently watching the show right now, Journeys, if you were to look at the, the world championships, do you feel like you've been, as a viewer, and this is, again, if you like it, if you don't like it, I just want to see your answers. Looking at Journeys as a whole and looking at the tournament, the world championships tournament, do you feel this tournament has done a good job being a tournament? Like, really? And I'm saying... If you like Journeys and you want to defend it, fine. Defend it on its parts that you like. I'm saying look at this as a tournament. Because, hell, I'll even be honest. 
uh, for my favorite series. That way you can't, uh, no one can just say that I'm being biased. X and Y league, like pacing wise, is terrible. It's a terrible league pacing wise. It's got some good battles. It's got some good ass fucking battles. And it even has the decency to show off this like cool little setup visually. It's great. Visually, Kalos is an awesome ass league visually. If you look at it visually. Like I like the I like the the battle arenas. I like the um I like the uh the fact that they fight in like a town in one of them where Ash and Halucha fight uh they fight um the Apso chick. They fight her in like the city. I like that. I like that the battlefield is this little city. That's cool. Uh, some of the battlefields are fucking cool. Visually it's great. Pacing wise it's terrible. Because Astrid, thank you. Pacing wise it's terrible. So, like, to me, Kalos is one of the worst handled leagues to me. Like, well, one of the worst. It's not the worst, but it's one of the worst handled leagues. The best handled league to me, if I had to pick a league that's well handled, um, I would debatably say the best handled league. Why that town used for 10 seconds? Hey, but I like the idea. The idea is fun. Also, what's up, KG? I was actually about to end it, KG, but if you want to join me, uh, if you had any input, then I could probably extend it for a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, no, they established the reason why certain battles are 1v... They established no reason why the certain battles are 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3. Uh, yeah, but that's the question I wanted to end this off on, guys, is... Um, do you feel... Nah, it's good, I'm here uh, cleaning up at home. Okay, yeah. So even I'll admit the Kalos League isn't the best handled league. If I had to pick a league that was the best handled... I like to say the Sinnoh League was done well. The Lily of the Valley Conference. I think the Lily of the Valley Conference is a root. It's a pretty decent league. It's a pretty decent league. I like the way, I like the way it's set up. Uh, I like I like the setup for it. It's, it's a simple bracket league, but it does at least cool like do the cool thing where it changes the battlefields. Uh, I like the fact that um, it's got that whole little. Um, it knows when uh, certain fights should be six v six and stuff. Um, I also like the fact that it has a nice. Um, divvy up of certain trainers fighting like you can see barry fighting off against paul and stuff like that ash's fight with the conductor and yeah they used varying different trainers and stuff like yeah you get to see some of that I, I think that league is handled pretty well uh johto's league is very unique and how it's handled but i think it's handled pretty well too uh Kalos league is rushed but visually i think the league setup is nice it's rushed. That's its biggest problem, but it's not nice. So it's so it's not perfect, but it is good at least. At least we get to see see like a nice. It, it looks visually good. But the world championships, a tournament that started basically in episode what twelve. Do you feel it's been handled well? Do you feel as of now? Do you feel the world championships is a well handled tournament? Like can you can you honestly say that? Can you on? Like, put aside what you like or dislike about Journeys. Put aside if you don't like Journeys or not. Put aside if you do like it or not. From a tournament standpoint, do you feel this was a well-handled tournament? KG, I know you're cleaning, but uh, can you answer this too? Uh, if you can't answer this too. If you can't, don't worry about it. I just want to see everybody's thoughts. I'm interested in everybody's thoughts. Yeah, it was well-implemented. Yeah, thank you, Rob. So... But do you feel the tournament was... Do you feel this tournament was well handled? Do you feel this is a good tournament? Absolutely not. Uh, yeah, I see people saying absolutely not. Hell no. Fuck no. Uh, I'm seeing people say no. Hell no. The Orange Islands was better. Uh, Ash uh, connected with his team. That, yeah, I, yeah. Hell, the Orange Islands, at least it had rules. Ash has to earn the, each of the seashells. He had to earn four of them. And each of the battles that he did were different. Like, he had to do different rules based on what the gym leaders had for uh, for him to do. But it was the setup. You do all of those things, and then you challenge Drake in a 6v6 fight. And the winner of the 6v6 fight becomes the champion of the Orange League. It's not the fa It's not the most, like... It's not the most interesting tournament, but it's handled well. This makes the tournament of power look good. Yeah, Sun and Moon I think had a pretty uh, had a better tournament set up. It was a battle royale, and then the last few trainers competed, and then you got to see all of the trainers fight in the tournament. Hell, I'll debatably say league wise, Sun and Moon's league setup was the best. 
My problem is the characters weren't fucking ready for it. <laughs> the roster's weird. That's my problem. But it's a good... But the bracket setup is at least good. The Orange Islands Trials is the real island trials. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to tackle that right now, but... Uh, yeah. The Hard Home Tag Tournament and the Wallace Cup are, are better. The World Islands Championship is better. Y'all remember that? <laughs> The club explosion was set up better. Like as I'm saying this only because this boasts itself as the world championships. If this was just some one-off tournament like that Hoenn uh, tournament that happened at the beginning of the series in episode seven, you know that that one-off tournament where the winner gets all those little flutes. That's fine. I mean, and it sets itself up as a regular preliminaries bracket that moves into a regular rosters bracket. But at least that was handled that way. Here we get a we get a ranking system tournament that barely follows its ranking well, doesn't know whether it wants to be 1v1, 2v2, or 3v3, has class systems that are based off of God knows what ranking system. It's a mess. It's a goddamn mess. And the only trainers that are participating in it right now actively are Ash and Leon. Yeah, the other trainers that compete against it are the ones fighting against it, but they always they obviously wind up either A losing or or be winning because they, they it was necessary towards Ash's character growth. And now that that arc is over, he proceeds to beat everybody. It just, it's just sloppy, man. It's just not a good tournament. And I'm like I said, I, and I'm putting my bias aside. Because like I said, even Kalos was a rush tournament. It looked good, but it was rushed. That was its downside. But at least it transitioned into like the Team Flare arc. And had a system. At least it had a system. This doesn't even have a system. It's just a mess. It's it's all over the place and it's sloppy. The Ringer is better. So the Jodo. Oh yeah, the Jodo Sumo tournament. I completely forgot that tournament existed. I think that was the Declar Island stuff though, wasn't it? But yeah, to end it off on that, I'll go ahead and say this. When, when we're looking at these, I only say these things because I know they can be done better, and they have been done better, not just from past series, but from the series itself. The idea is great, a world tournament. That's awesome. Everybody can compete. It's following a ranking system, so the ranking goes up and down, obviously based on your performance in the tournament, and it's an active tournament that happens pretty much all the time until we finally get to, like, the finals, whatever the hell that is. Maybe at the time. Um, and then obviously the top eight is where the big events happen. People sit in stadiums and watch this. Thematically, that sounds cool. But it's not handled well. That's the problem. And that's the main thing that I talk about when I say do battles tell a story is because these battles are trying to tell that story and they're not doing that story any justice. We have no good context for these things. So when looking at it through that perspective, I've always stopped and think of what could have been instead of what we actually got. And again, that's thinking after the after the fact, but I'm only thinking after the fact based on what we've been given. And what we've been given is mediocre to not good. 